record, my name is Andrea Campbell. I'm the District 4 uh, City Councilor. I'm also chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Um, if everyone could mute, that would be fantastic so we don't have any feedback. Um, I am joined by, and if we miss you or take you out of order, I apologize, but I'm jo joined by my colleagues, Councilor Nisa Sabi George, Councilor Bach, Councilor Flynn, and Councilor Braden. And I do know that some other councilors will join us along the way. And of course, thank you to all the folks from the administration from taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. I know how busy you guys and women are, so thank you uh, to the administration. Um, today's, and uh, before I get to that, this is a public hearing. It is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city council TV. It will be rebroadcast on Comcast channel eight, RCN channel 82, and Verizon channel 1964. We will take public testimony throughout the hearing. If you wish to testify via video conference, uh, I think you should have probably already emailed Michelle, but if you have something to add, you can email central staff uh, Michelle Goldberg at michelle.a.goldberg at boston.gov for the link. We're asking uh, folks who are giving public testimony to restrict it to two minutes. I've made an exception for two other folks who are joining us. Um, from two separate organizations to give about five minutes, given their work in on these grants and in this specific area. Today's hearing is on four different grants. The first is docket 0408, a message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $850,000 in the form of a grant for the FY20 Boston Regional Intelligence Center earmark awarded by the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the police department. The second grant is docket 0710, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $30,722.91 in the form of a grant for the federal FY16 innovations and community-based crime reduction Form, formerly the Byrne Criminal Justice, passed through the Boston Public Health Commission to be administered by the police department. The third is docket 0752, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,297,758 in the form of a grant for the FY20 Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. And lastly, the fourth docket for today's hearing is docket 0831, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $120,000 in the form of a grant for the Harrison Albany Block Public Benefits Fund awarded by the Boston Redevelopment Authority to be administered by the Boston Police Department. And there are several folks from the administration, which I will get to, um, who will testify with respect to each docket. And uh, just want to acknowledge, it looks like I've been joined also by uh, council colleague Matt O'Malley, so thank you. I don't have a chat feature on here, so I think it's going to make it a little bit more complicated to, under, to sort of see who. So Michelle and, um, I, and Carrie, if I miss anyone, let me know. Uh, we have also been joined by Councilor uh, Michael, Flaher Michael Flaherty. Thank you. And... I am going to start with, before starting with the administration, I'm going to give uh, five minutes to two separate folks to testify, five minutes each. Um, the first is uh, Lauren, who I believe has a set of, I think it's a total of, I think, four slides. Uh, so Lauren Chambers from ACLU. And Carrie and Michelle will get your slides up on the screen. Um, she will do five minutes and then I will move on to Fatima who will do five minutes and then I will move on to the administration. And then I will go to my council colleagues for questions um, for uh, the administration with respect to each docket. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, and thank you to all the members of the Boston City Council, especially for the opportunity to speak for a slightly longer time this morning. That's really great to hear. Um, I will wait until those slides get put up until I launch into what I've got to share today. Sounds great, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Perfect. Carrie and Michelle. Okay, that looks great. So today I... Uh,
urge you all to reject dockets so, 0731 and so yeah, sorry. Sorry. if everyone can mute themselves, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, and especially docket 0408, which allocates EOPS funding to the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, or as we're all familiar, the BRIC. So as the technology fellow at the ACLU of Massachusetts, I have recently analyzed the BRIC Oh, so that we can hear Lauren and the, and the public can hear Lauren. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, and two spends exorbitantly on largely unnecessary technologies. So if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. According to public records obtained and compiled by the ACLU of Massachusetts, the BRIC is funded by a combination of federal, state, and local budgets and grants, which combined lead to the BRIC receiving at least seven to $8 million each year in public funds. Uh, it's important to note that the BRIC earmark, which is the subject of docket 0408 today, uh, which uh, would make up actually just a minority of the BRICS funding. So in FY20, this EOPS earmark would have made up only about 10% of the BRICS total budget. Um, I'd like to also kind of comment on how difficult it has been to gather information around exactly what sources of funding the BRIC has. So. On the chart that I'm showing here in purple is what we know is allocated through the Boston Police Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis. What's in gray is what is allocated through the Department, Federal Department of Homeland Security's FEMA grants, uh, and that was determined through a FOIA request. What's shown in black is what is allocated directly through the Massachusetts state budget through EOPS. And what's shown in red is a somewhat confusing yearly allocation from EOPS that appears as an external fund on the Boston public safety budget. Um, however, it's possible that these four uh, sources that we've identified don't actually encompass all of the BRIC funding sources. For instance, um, there was a line item on the BPD contracts that were submitted during budget season this past year, one line item for $4 million in contracts to Centra Technologies, which we have reason to believe uh, employs intelligence analysts at the BRIC. Um, so it's possible that, you know, a couple million dollars each year, in addition to what I'm showing here, is going towards the BRIC. Um, next slide, please. Between 2017 and 2020, expense reports received by the ACLU show that the BRIC spent at least $1.3 million on hardware and software. So a thorough review of these reports reveal some exorbitant spending on everything from software of all flavors, scary surveillance technology, frivolous gadgets in some cases, and some kind of mysterious things. So some of the expenses that stand out I've listed here, including $350,000 towards 13 different specialized software products. But in many cases, these software are duplicated. So there are three different geospatial analysis products in there, two public record search products, and two device data extraction products. Um, so these specialized software are kind of being doubled up upon, it seems, in many cases. There's 164,000 to, uh, quote, BRIV AV upgrade per bit event, which I just don't know what that means. And it's actually the largest single expense which appeared on the expense reports that we received. So that's a bit of a mystery. We have 106,000 uh, for single pole concealment cameras, which is an obvious uh, surveillance mechanism. Uh, 37 thousand dollars for quote engineering support from pj symptom systems incorporated again that's a mystery to me we have a full eleven thousand for ipad pros and apple pencils so it seems as though the brick enjoys spending a lot on very specific apple products uh, and perhaps most concerningly ten thousand for quote shop vac camera systems and tissue box concealments which imply that the brick is hiding surveillance cameras and tissue boxes and vacuum cleaners. So the smorgasbord of tools begs the question, what if any supervisor, supervisory procedures exist within the BRIC to prevent irresponsible spending of taxpayer dollars on these expensive and often duplicative software and unnecessary hardware that we see in the expense reports. Um, and then last slide, please. Uh, it's important to understand 
that ultimately the city of Boston is taking the brunt of the BRIC spending. So the available de budget documents from fiscal year 20, though I, as I said before, might not actually enc encompass all of the BRIC funding, show that 55% of all BRIC funds in FY20 came from the city of Boston. Where are they right now? So while there is much evidence in support of the BRIC being wholly defunded, at today's hearing, I'm simply asking the city council to take a milder action in rejecting dockets 0408, 0710, and 0831, and in doing so, taking the first steps to end the practice of writing blank checks for the Boston police to continue excessive and unsupervised spending of taxpayer dollars. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren, uh, for the testimony and, um, and for keeping it uh, within time. I appreciate that. And now I'm going to move on to uh, Fatima Ahmad from the Muslim Just Justice League, who will also do five minutes. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Councillor Campbell and City Council for, um, you know, having me and Lauren actually present early on. Um, I'm going to actually pose uh, quite a number of questions to the Boston Police Department and BRIC because we rarely get a chance to actually get these these answers. And so I hope, um, counselors, that some of you can back me up in actually getting some of these answers today or hopefully within um within the next week. And I think, you know, the first question and part of why we even had to have this follow-up hearing is that it is not transparent, not clear at all to any of us what BRICS budget truly is, right? Lauren just presented uh, after all of her research, which I think, you know, someone as brilliant as Lauren shouldn't have to spend a ton of time finding out what your budget is, right? There are many other things I think that Lauren could be could be doing with her time, but we really appreciate that she has, she dug up all of that information. Um, but as a public agency, we hope that you can actually provide a really clear understanding of what your budget is, not just within the city funding, but also what state and federal funding um, BRIC is receiving. We have also been trying to understand for years now who actually works within the brick right there's an org chart i think publicly online somewhere that indicates that you know the bureau of intelligence and, and analysis under bpd is uh, i think you know overseeing brick but that's as, as far as your org chart goes that we can see and that's really not an org chart we need to understand you know how many staff are within brick and then also who else can access that data, right? It publicly says that, you know, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, many state agencies, probably other federal agencies, all are um, part of the BRIC. What does that actually mean? Are there FBI agents staffed, you know, within BRIC who are there every day, or do they just have access to all of the information about people, not just in Boston, but of course the, the greater Boston region. And also how do you all work with, you know, those agencies beyond just sharing information? Like what actual actions are, are you all involved in? Is the BRIC part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force? Um, you know, was the BRIC involved in like the federal raid that just, that happened recently of I think about 30, 30 people um, that were, that was gang related, um, you know, what, what does the BRIC like actually do? What does that entitle um, those agents to do? What kind of information sharing is happening? Um, and who can access all of that data? And what is all of that data? Right, we keep here. We keep learning bit by bit that there are cameras feeding into Brick, which I think two of the you know grant today that include cameras, I believe, uh, feed into the Real Time Crime Center. We would really like to get an understanding of what the Real Time Crime Center entails. What is all the equipment and software? Um, that you know feeds into the real-time crime center, and again, who has access 
to that, um, especially since you know this eight hundred fifty thousand dollar grant is from from the last hearing. My understanding is you all are looking to add four new staff to the real time crime center, which would double the staff of the real time crime center and also add two um, intelligence analysts. At least that's what I remember from the last hearing. But I hope you all can clarify. Um, as I was doing some, you know, last minute research last night, I also found this article from uh, the Boston University Police Department um, chief, who I think previously Kelly worked with Brick, um, and she mentions being in close communication with Brick every week. And so we'd like to understand what are all of the universities and schools, not just universities, but you know, Boston Public Schools, we know, I think, are, are feeding information through um, Boston School Police into Brick. What are all the universities and other schools that are feeding information into Brick about our young people? Uh, as Lauren brought up, we want to know if that $4 million contract to Centra Technologies is related to the BRIC and how that is related. And on a personal note, you know, I just want to remind people that we're talking about, you know, the same department that was caught using like social media surveillance, looking at people using hashtag Black Lives Matter, right? And looking at Muslims using just regular terms like Ummah, which means literally the Muslim community, uh, which I can't even count how many times I have, you know, texted, tweeted, uh, you know, use that in, in social media. We're talking about the same group of people who I think have a file on former counselor Tito Jackson, who also ran for mayor a few years ago. I would love to know if I have a file in the brick and how can I find out what you all, what information you all have on me? How can any of us find out if we are uh, in the gang database? Because I sure know a whole lot of people who suspect that they're in it based on how they get harassed by police officers regularly. And yet we don't know, you know, how to even find out what information about us uh, is, is being stored. Um, and not just being stored, but being shared again with federal agents, agencies like the Department of Homeland Security and like the FBI. Um, I would, I was planning this morning to talk more about, you know, what we could actually do with this money and how we could be bold. You know, we're talking about alternatives to 911. And I was dreaming last night of how we could, instead of having the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, we should have, with all the hospitals that we have in Boston, there should be a regional <laughs> healthcare support, right? That actually gets people um, what they need. But since I was given the opportunity to actually go, you know, early in this hearing for once, which was really exciting. I just wanted to get all of those questions out. So really excited to uh, get some answers today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fatima. And um, at this point, I'm going to move on to uh, the administration. But before I do, just want to put out some procedural things. So first, um, you know, like I said at the beginning of the hearing, thank you to all the representatives from the police department, from the administration for being here. Um, just want to be clear that two of the dockets we're reviewing this morning were first heard during a committee hearing on June 4th. Um, but because we didn't have uh, Superintendent uh, David and others from the BRIC and other BPD staff, we felt like we should leave those dockets in the committee for folks to be able to, to answer questions today, specifically with respect to those dockets. And that includes, let me just be clear on the docket number, that is specifically docket number 0408 and 0710. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we've received thousands of emails and calls with respect to these dockets. Um, in addition to that, we have um, continued to re receive thousands or more emails and, and, and uh, calls with respect to these dockets, even though the hearing was initially held on June 4th. So flagging that. Um, lastly, these funds, to be clear, are earmarked for intended, an intended purpose. And the council as an institution does not have the authority to redirect these particular funds 
to other sources or elsewhere. Um, we will review, of course, each docket. The administration will choose who they'll have speak on each docket. The counselors will ask a round of questions, um, and then we'll move into more public testimony. There is a hard stop for this hearing around 1130, just being mindful of everyone's schedule. So I will be moving quite quickly through and then keeping folks on time um, to be mindful uh, of, of the time limit, but also to be respectful of everyone's schedule and, and uh, some conflicts following the hearing. So at this time, I think I will start with, oh, before I jump in, I've been joined by counselors, uh, Frank Baker, Julia Mejia, and Michelle Wu. And so first I will start with, uh, let's start with docket 0408. This was the docket previously held. And I think superintendent, this is the brick docket, uh, Carabin, you're going to speak. And if you have others who you want to speak, feel free to, uh, to have them go after you. And I started with some of the organizations and some public testimony because these are obviously questions that have come up here, but also in emails we received and wanting to, of course, give you an opportunity not only to provide testimony, but to respond in any way uh, with respect to those questions. And then I will move on to other speakers for this docket. And then I'll move on to the other dockets before then turning it over to my colleagues for a round of questions. Uh, Superintendent Carabin, it's all you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, so um, I'm here with Superintendent Charles Wilson. Uh, he is the superintendent of the Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis, which oversees the, uh, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. Um, myself, I'm the assistant chief of the Bureau and the director of the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the comments that were made by Ms. Ahmad and uh, Ms. Chambers. Um, I will say that we did not receive any of these questions ahead of time. So many of the questions I am not prepared to answer at this moment, uh, nor is the superintendent as we are, uh, you know, we're on a recorded under oath uh, type of a hearing and we don't want to give uh, misleading information or false information and then be held uh, accountable for that after the fact. Uh, we'd rather absorb the questions that were asked and get back to you with accuracy. Um, I will say that uh, I want to add to that that a lot of the matters that were raised by Ms. Chambers and Ms. Ahmed um, are, are issues that have been discussed in open public forums and open settings. Um, the notion that we're hiding things is, um, is a false notion. We have nothing to hide here. Uh, we are a law enforcement organization within the Boston Police Department that stands to serve the public of Boston and the Metro Boston Homeland Security region. Um, there's a lot of accusations out there that are flatly untrue um, and, and frankly misleading. And I want to, uh, you know, make sure that that is crystal clear and stated on the record here. Um, and uh, we will, at an appropriate time, um, will meet with all of you and, and have uh, a conversation with some more accurate information in front of us at our hands uh, where we can uh, speak specifically towards those issues. Um, so I just want to start with that. Uh, Super, any, anything to add? Yes, I'd, I'd like to add, uh, thank you first of all for having us here. I'd like to echo uh, Dave Carabin's statement. Uh, we did, at one time, before this COVID pandemic, discussed bringing up members of the city council, um, public safety committee, and as well as any other city councils that wanted to come up to the brick um, to show them around and explain what we do. And uh, we're very, very victim focused in, in many aspects. And uh, we're very mindful of, of people's civil rights. So I, I think there's a lot of misnomers out there. I think a lot of things are very simple fixes. Uh, it just comes down to putting people in the same room and uh, getting a broader perspective of what we do. Thank you. And uh, Councilor Campbell, if I could just add, uh, you and your staff have been up uh, for a visit to the BRIC. It's been a few years. And I would hope that a lot of the misstatements that were made uh, do not ring true based on our conversations we've had in the past, as well as um, um, the visit that we did have. And we do remain open, as the superintendent said, to a, a, a visit anytime in the near future as well for, uh, for further conversation. Um, for purposes uh, of what so we're just, here. Just to interject really quickly, superintendent, and thank you both for that. I do think there is value in um, maybe members of organizations 
um, being open to such a visit, right? I think um, there are some legitimate questions with respect to budget and, and transparency that I think um, if they can't be answered in the first round of questions with counselors, um, that we that I will I will personally as chair of the committee follow up with all of those questions to get concrete answers and then hopefully work to actually be able to maybe create a visit not for us per se because i think there's still lingering questions but for other folks representing um, other organizations that are doing incredible work um, i think there's value in them um, being able to visit and, and to have a meeting and conversation with you guys so i'll follow up on that separately but i do want to get through the dockets and um and, and then open it up for questions from all colleagues. Thank you both, and thank you, Superintendent Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. So for the purposes of what we're here for today is with the uh, 2020 EOS earmark. Um, and in that, what we are looking to do is, uh, is to fund five civilian data analyst positions and one uh, civilian analytic uh, supervisor uh, that will augment several gaps in the BRICS analytical operation. Um, ultimately, the addition of these positions will help our Bureau reduce the frequency that we have to uh, lean on backfill and overtime uh, to fill uh, shift vacancies and, and frankly, um, just complete vacancies where we do not have enough people to uh, support the operation uh, on a, on a um, seven day a week cycle as, as we are structured to work. Um, additionally, we're hoping that this will provide us with an opportunity to collaborate better with key local law enforcement agencies that operate in the city of Boston um, so that we can better understand and positively impact crime and quality of life issues uh, in areas of Boston that Boston does not specifically police. And for example, that would include uh, jurisdictions that are under the authority of the Massachusetts State Police, um, the Transit Police, as well as Massport. Um, so in the end, what we're looking to do is uh, ultimately gain a better understanding of criminal activity and quality of life issues as they're occurring and uh, put our city in a better position to be able to respond and collaborate with these agencies to um, improve quality of life. Is anyone looking, anyone else looking to testify in this particular docket, Superintendent? No. I'm going to um, then go to the other uh, dockets and then I will start with questions from counselors. So now I'm going to move on to docket 0710 and we previously did this docket um, before but I didn't know Marie I think you spoke to this one if I'm correct. Cheevers. Sorry I can't see yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Um, and I know there was a there was a, a lingering question with respect to this one because it had to do with cameras and if it fed into the brick in any way. So I didn't know if you had a uh, follow up um, testimony on this docket or if the superintendent uh, Wilson or superintendent uh, Carabin had uh, follow up testimony on this particular docket. Um, this do you want me to in general, general talk about what the grant is. You can quickly. I think it was covered okay. in the June 4th hearing, but the, the, the outstanding question was specifically with the cameras in the area, um, would that feed into the brick in some way, would be connected to the brick? And because we didn't have a representative from the brick, um, we put a pin in that question. Okay. Um, so back to that docket, if you or our superintendent, uh, Carabin or Wilson have, have follow up there. Okay. Um, I can just in general tell you about what the grant program is for. It basically was a Boston Public Health Commission grant to do community organizing in the Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood over an extended period of time. Um, there was a strategic planning process that was involved that came, that came out with recommendations. There was a survey to 237 residents. There was another survey of uh, 20 youth out of the process of strategic planning and the surveys together with the community, um, they had come up with a, a wide range of recommendations. A small portion of that was specific to public safety. And so of that wider, broader, long-term strategic planning process, we ended up getting involved uh, with the community around some SEPTED training, which is community policing through environmental design. 
uh, and I can send you information about what that's about. And also the purchase of four cameras to be located in the Bowdoin and Geneva Target neighborhood. Um, it is my understanding that those four cameras, once installed, will be connected to a wider citywide network of um, cameras that exist um, with throughout the city um, and along with a number of other cameras that are um, within that network. Now, regarding that network, I could, I could, I could probably hand that over to Sean Romanowski and or Dave and our superintendent Wilson. And so I'm gonna stop now and, and, and that hand great. that section to them. Thank you. Sean Romanowski, are you on the call? I am on the call. Sean, do you wanna to speak to that? Yes. Thank you. Oh. And thank you, Sean. And thank you, uh, David. So, um, the, the way the, the camera system is set up, it's actually not correct to, it's not a brick camera system. It's actually a Bureau of Administration technology. We are the technology arm of the Boston Police Department. We're the ones that fix the computers and um, you know a host of other things, fix the radio. One of the um, systems that we're responsible for is the uh, camera system that brings approximately 750 cameras into a single platform. So this platform, as we add to it, many of these are through the uh, accept and expand program um, with uh, communities, you know, everything from uh, there's a uh, organization in uh, Mattapan Square, downtown crossing. So many of these cameras are at the request of the community. And we work with them on where the cameras are to be placed, be placed as well as how those cameras are used. And typically the cameras are used, they record, they um, record for 30 days and at 30 days, they automatically delete the video unless it becomes part of the case. And we, um, we did a study several years ago, and the amount of video that is viewed by anyone within the Boston Police Department is something like less than one hundredth of one percent because almost all of the video automatically deletes. So these four cameras would be added into the existing system. Now, the brick just happens to be one customer that they can view the cameras. So they log in and we audit when logs in. We audit what they download. So if any of that... Um, data were to be misused, we would know. The primary objective of this is a 911 call comes in and it indicates that that happened. So typically that case would be handed over to an investigator or what have you. And that becomes one, one small piece of the larger investigation. So many times it's auto accidents and those sorts of uh, things that people are you know, requesting. So that's the, the general idea of how the camera system works. It's often, there's many names for it. It's called FLIR. It's called the brick camera system. It's called um, canopy system. But at the end of the day, there's only one camera system in the Boston Police Department, and that, that is the camera system that's maintained and operated by the Bureau of Administration. Thank you. I apologize, I'm on mute, but thank you, Sean. Um, that was helpful, and I appreciate you being here to provide uh, more clarification. Um, I wanna quickly acknowledge that we've been joined by um, our council president, Kim Janey. Um, at this time, I'm going to move on to the next docket, which is docket 0752. Um, Marie, are you going to speak to this docket or is someone else on the team going to speak to this coronavirus specific docket? I will give you the broader view, but the specific sub projects within the overall project, we have representatives from each unit. That okay. So, so I'll have you start and then you can call on the next person with respect to uh, that yep. docket. Thank so, you. Um, the city of Boston each year gets a formula grant from the federal government based on our part one and part two crime numbers. So in years that our, number, that our crime numbers are up, we, the formula dictates that we get more funding in the year when crime is down, we get less funding. And that's called the Burn JAG, um, Burn JAG Criminal Justice Grant. They use that particular formula continuation grant to provide the city of Boston, particularly the Boston Police Department with COVID Really emergency relief funding. So it's not a separate grant source, it's a supplement to an ongoing and existing grant program. Uh, the, the, 
the base program, which is the JAG program, um, basically pays for a training coordinator for all the IT work that we do, a domestic violence uh, crime data analyst, and we're going to be hiring soon a hub uh, community-based coordinator and organizer to create the hub program models throughout. However, this extra money had come in, um, also based on a formula, and Boston was to receive 1,297,000, I'm sorry, $1.2 million, without getting into the change, I can give you the specifics. Um, and with that money, the COVID grant basically stated that it was for local uh, police jurisdictions to utilize to prepare for response around COVID. And so with that said, Boston has 16 distinct neighborhoods. We have uh, 11 districts. We have other public facing buildings, including police headquarters. And we have several units that consistently on a daily basis, 24 hours interface with the public by either the public coming into these buildings or by being into the community and providing services and resources to community. And so what we needed to do with this money is we needed to think creatively of where are we interacting with people and how do we make that safe, safe space um, and safe in other ways in which we have to operate our daily business. So with that said, the money was sort of broken up into various units that mo are more likely to interface not only with the public, but in the case of the academy with other police offices. In the case of family support, uh, police offices and their family members. And so the money was broken down to support the academy's operations, the Bureau of Administration and Technology, which will be doing a lot of uh, building safety work, um, the peer and family support unit, the street outreach unit, which works with the mental health, uh, substance use disorder and the homeless populations, the Bureau of Community Engagement, which works greatly with youth and families and students, um, and the Office of Multimedia uh, Communications. So in the order of the budget, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to the Police Academy first, and I, that is Sergeant John King, I believe. And so I'm gonna hand it off to him now. Let me just make sure he's here. Joseph King, can you hear me? Is this Sergeant King that you're referencing? Yes, this is, uh, hi, good morning, Sergeant King, but I'm, I'm with the uh, peer support and okay. family assistance unit, not the academy, just to be clear. Sorry about that. You, you can no also worries. go first if you'd like. Well, I'm unmuted, so we might as well, you Yeah, know, go you ahead. Put it, you put a coin in. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, thank, you. Here. thank you, and thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Um, just, um, I'm, a, I'm a sergeant of the Boston Police. I'm also the director of the peer support unit. We're also, um, I also supervise what's known as the Family Assistance Unit. Um, we've been around since about 1977. Our primary mission is just is exactly what it says, peer support to help the officers during their times of crisis, whether it be family crisis, uh, job-related crises, which we usually refer to as critical incidents, um, suicide prevention, issues around maybe alcohol or drug abuse. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's more of a, it's a, proactive, we're actually one of a kind first in the nation, along with the department unit. We for, we found out we were first in the nation after uh, the 9-11, when we sent team members down there to help debrief and work with the officers and the first responders down there with the, with the model that we already have in place here. And since then, we're called on a lot throughout the country to ask, uh, how do we how do we go about supporting our staff, supporting our officers? And, and, the, and the biggest mission for us, I look at it, is, is building the resiliency in our officers, their mental, emotional well-being, their physical well-being, and, and keeping them healthy and on the street and in, in clear minds to serve the public. Um, one of the specific things you might ask, family assistance, uh, they'll help a lot with officers who are injured, which we have on a regular basis, from various degrees of minor injuries to very severe injuries. and. Um, they're, they're a big part of what they do is help their families navigate the hospital systems and get through and give them support while they're in this time of crisis. The, the peer support arm is more on the lines of what I said. Um, or it, a big thing we do is critical incident 
stress management and response, and that involves a lot of peer counseling and a lot of proactive work, as well as a, a very good amount of reactive response work we do when we're notified of issues within the department. I, I could get into the specifics, but I don't want to go over my two minutes. I'll happily ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone's playing incredible music there, but thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, Sergeant King. Um, Maria, is there anyone else you would like to speak on this grant? And also, is there a specific breakdown of, you know, this is a large grant. Is there a specific breakdown? If so, I'm not sure that the council has received that on how that money will be dispersed. And if so, you know, how the one, nearly 1.3 million would be dispersed and to whom? If so, if you could send that to, to our, our staff, that would be great. And Maria, feel free to call on whoever you think is next uh, to speak to, to this, specific, this specific docket. Maria, I can deal with the BAT portal if you want. Oh, thank you, Sean, go right ahead. And I think Maria might be having issues with unmuting. Go ahead, Sean, and then Carrie, maybe we can work with Maria on her muting. Thanks, Sean. Good, good morning. So the, uh, so three portions of it, so yes, you are correct, um, that there, it is broken down and that we do have a write up on that and Maria um, put that for us. So the first portion of the, the Bureau of Administration Technology is something referred to as digital signage. It's basically a, an internal television network the, um, the reason we um, have proposed this is it allows for a lot of separation as well as a lot of information sharing. So the general um, concept is that there are large screen monitors placed throughout strategically throughout the Boston Police Department throughout the 11 districts, but we also have um, multiple um, things such as headquarters and special operations. So this will allow um, in many instances, instead of having the morning roll calls and such, they will be gathering their information over a television monitor and it will be 24 7 365. So as they go in and out of the facility, they will see uh, messages that pertain to things such as um, you know, safety masks, you know, as well as other things that are pertinent to the Boston Police Department. There's also a second component of this, which is as the general public comes into one of the police districts, each one has a, uh, a community room as well as a, uh, a main lobby, which we, um, you know, we serve customers a window. So in that area, there will also be the same digital signage system to allow um, customers, you know, where they can go, telephone numbers they can call, as well as giving them instruction on separation or um, you know, social distancing, mask, that sort of thing. Along that same process is a call screening. Oftentimes, it's a face-to-face -face interaction. One of the things we're proposing is that we want to offer um, telephone system. So as they go into the lobby, they can get the exact same service over the telephone if they, if they say so choose. And we are also putting video cameras in the uh, lobby as well. So if something does happen, that will be due to the central location. So that's under our call screening program. So many times when you need a report or what have you, instead of having this long interaction, you will be able to quickly um, either do it via computer or a telephone or a face-to-face -face, um, if you so desire. But that, of course, is um, you know, the, at the uh, customer's request. Another component is the courthouse video arraignment. So typically, there's a long process when an individual is arraigned and they have to go to the court. What we're proposing is giving an option where instead of um, processing them out of the district, putting them in a vehicle, taking them to the court, processing them into the court, they have a small meeting, they you know, reverse the process. What this will allow is a secure, system where they can do a video arraignment from each police district to each court within the city of Boston. So uh, don't quote me on this, I believe there are 13 courts that we're proposing to place these at. So that will greatly reduce the amount of contact as well as the amount of movements required for all of these, uh, all these activities. And that's the, uh, that's the, the portion of the telecommunications. Thank you, Sean, that's uh, very helpful. Um, Maria, who else do you have to testify in this docket? Um, I have Sergeant James Blake, and Sergeant James Blake is with the Boston Police Academy, and he will speak about the portion of the budget that they received and the work they will be doing with that money. So he and is we can on. We the breakdown, right, via email, the full breakdown? Yes, I, I, okay. I assume you received the breakdown already. I'm not sure. I have I the have budget in front of me, but we can send you that. 
Um, Michelle, we'll yep. thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, good morning, Councilor. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody, councilors and invited guests. I am Sergeant James Blake. I'm the registrar of the Boston Police Academy. On behalf of Superintendent Winifred Carter and Captain Philip Terenzi, thank you for allowing us to uh, give our statement. Uh, the Bureau of Professional Development is responsible for extensive training to all department personnel, including student officers, in-service training for our veteran officers, and various specialized trainings. The Bureau includes the Academy Division, the Student Officers Group, and the Firearms Training Unit. The Academy Division is responsible for training police recruits, and oftentimes these classes uh, do include up to 150 police recruits. With social distancing due to COVID-19, these tasks uh, will be difficult as we discovered when we instituted our response to it, as the academy currently operates out of an old school building in the Hyde Park neighborhood section of Boston, which is typically at full capacity on a daily basis. Given that, the Bureau will need a wide range of computer equipment, software, and supplies to keep up with its mission, including computers, software, laptops, and virtual meeting technology, along with training and camcorders, as well as other technology to enable distance learning in the new video-based curriculum that we're currently developing. With that, I am open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Appreciate the testimony. Uh, Maria, do you have um, someone else willing uh, to testify on this docket? Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Dickerson. Laura Dickerson uh, represents the Bureau of Community Engagement, and she'll speak about first the work of the Bureau of Community Engagement and then the budget. Um, okay. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. And thank you, Laura. Good morning. Um, and thank Good you morning. for this opportunity. I am representing Superintendent Nora Baskin and Deputy Superintendent Chin. I am the Director of Projects and Initiatives for the Bureau of Community Engagement. And uh, I have to say, to, to say, put it mildly, the pandemic sort of affected the whole engagement part of, of our Bureau, but we persisted. Um, we, had, we helped deliver laptops to uh, BPS students. We did um, over 100 um, food deliveries to seniors daily. We gave out gift cards to uh, food challenged um, families over $1,500 worth. And so what this grant will do will help us um, connect with or stay connected to our young people through technology. So actually I am looking, we have uh, about a hundred kids out in the Southwest corridor right now, social distancing um, for the summer program. but. Um, this grant will help us uh, support the programs for um, for our, our youth and keeping them connected. Thank you, Laura. Is that is that it? Um, oh, yeah. I didn't want to cut you off. No, 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 I'm good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Laura. Maria. Uh, we have Sergeant Peter Messina, who's the commander of the Street Outreach Unit. And the Street Outreach Unit, again, works with uh, populations afflicted with mental health, substance use disorder, and homelessness. And so I will ask Peter to uh, speak now. Thank Good morning, ma'am. My name is uh, Sergeant Peter Messina from the uh, Boston Police Department Street Outreach Unit. Uh, our mission is a uh, community-based outreach through partnerships and collaboration to those affected by mental illness, substance use disorder, and homelessness in a professional, humane, and supportive manner. Uh, we aim to connect those individuals with services before they engage in criminal activity or public disorder. Um, COVID-19 has, uh, we continued on during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we adjusted some of our services uh, during that time. Um, it also allowed us to uh, think of innovative ways on how we're going to move forward um, providing services to our clients on the street uh, and to our partners. Uh, more specifically, uh, we've identified uh, pre-COVID, we uh, were working uh, to do community events, uh, outreach events, 
Uh, our main outreach event was monthly down at the uh, Mass Ave and Topeka Street area. Uh, it consisted of us servicing uh, 75 to 100 individuals, engaging with these individuals in order to provide them services. Um, it was successful. Uh, we've invited, uh, we partnered up with a lot of nonprofit organizations along with city agencies. Uh, so during COVID, we obviously had to uh, shut those down for the past couple of months, but we've come up with alternatives. Um, and these alternatives, we're looking to spread those events citywide to impact, to affect the neighbors or the neighborhoods that are uh, impacted by this uh, the opioid epidemic. Um, we are, have already started doing outreach events in uh, Nubian. Uh, we're gonna start doing, doing them back up in Ma the Mass and Cass area, along with uh, the North Station area, uh, Ramsey Park area, uh, and Ingleston Square area. So we've identified uh, some equipment uh, that we will need to help out with these, um, these events. Um, and that will be listed in the, uh, the document that uh, I believe uh, Maria will be uh, sending over. But uh, these events uh, do consist of us partnering up with uh, nonprofits. And in order to do that, to have these events, we would like to have a trailer um, with an office to actually engage on one-on-one -on -one with the clients on the street, uh, along with uh, storage, Connex boxes, um, and smart boards to have meetings prior to these actual events. Uh, these events do take a lot of planning and a lot of time uh, to get up and running. So uh, a smart board with a computer would would be uh, instrumental in having these uh, these meetings. Um, also, we've identified uh, software that would be needed to uh, to assist uh, the street outreach unit uh, in moving forward dealing with the opiate crisis. And this uh, software uh, allows us to partner up with other agencies, uh, so we all have access to that software, so there's no duplication of efforts. Um, I'm open to any questions that anybody may have. Hopefully I hit everything I need to hit. Yes, thank you, uh, Sergeant. I appreciate you being here and um, providing that testimony, so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Maria, Thank you. Maria, do you have uh, anyone else testifying on this specific docket? I know it's a large one, so thank you all for participating. Um, so I have Greg Mahoney here. Greg Mahoney is the director of the Multimedia Communications Office. I know I probably um, um, should have introduced him earlier. He's doing a lot of the signage citywide. So I'm going to stop and let Greg uh, go from here. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Greg. <laughs> No, Greg, you might still be having audio issues. I know we were trying to test your mic earlier. Sorry, and, and if we have to, um, we can get written testimony that you can submit to the committee and we can follow up. Um, sorry about that. I know we were trying to work to get the audio fixed. Maria, feel free to, to uh, speak to anything Greg might have spoken to if, if we didn't have the audio connection issues. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Madam Chair, he may want to. Uh, he may. He may want to stop the video. It may improve his audio. He can try. I think we, we we attempted to do something earlier. Greg, have you tried to turn off your video and just try your audio? Uh, There's still an echo. Yeah, still an echo. We did try. So what we'll do, Maria, if you could um, maybe if you want to speak to anything, Greg would speak to, and then we can get some follow up written testimony from him. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Greg. So the name of the office is the Office of Multimedia Productions. Uh, the Office of Multimedia Productions prepare illustrations, department forms, graphic layouts, crime scene sketches, and other artwork as required by various units and divisions of the department. It also produces training and informational videos and provides videotaping services for crime scene investigations, lineups, demonstrations, and special events. With, C, with, with these COVID funds, the Office of Media, Multimedia Productions will work closely with the Bureau of Public Information to create and publicize real-time content related specifically to COVID-19 safety and resource information consistently and over time. Greg, you can mute you. Sorry, there's okay. a feedback. Greg, if we can mute you. Thank you. Go ahead, Maria. Yep. Um, 
In order to meet the ongoing and real-time information generation and sharing needs of the City of Boston and the Boston Police Department, the Multimedia Production Office will need a high-quality printer for COVID-related mailings, synthetic and durable media pr products, and small signage capabilities on corrugated box materials. In addition, the office will need a small color digital press for COVID-related content creation, proofing, and for large productions for printed COVID-related materials. Um, so basically, we need to be quick and adaptable um, with changing news and changing information that has to get out to the police districts, uh, as well as the general public around uh, safety and protocols and policies as we move forward with COVID. And in order to save time and save cost and increase adaptability, it's easier for us to produce in real time out of the, the uh, multimedia uh, productions office. And so that's, um, if you have any questions, I'll try to ask them. And I also could text with Greg. I think I have the cell phone. So Excuse me, can you go Greg, Greg, Sorry, Greg, oh, this Greg. Come on, Greg. So if you have any questions, you can hit him. <laughs> about that. No idea why. Thank you, Laura. And thanks, Greg, for being flexible and moving around. I know you guys have to do math, so appreciate that. Um, Maria sort of gave a summary, but is there anything else you want to add, Greg? Well, I missed some of the summary, but uh, I mean, essentially, <laughs> the gist is, is that yep. uh, we're looking for new machines to be able to better address the immediacy where it, these machines allow us to be more nimble and to be able to produce um, smaller quantity signage that we need to do that's permanent, semi-permanent, uh, which we've done a load of uh, since the pandemic um, has kicked in, way more than we typically do. So these machines are basically augmenting our existing uh, infrastructure for um, <clears throat> creating visual materials and just enhance and allow us to do more than we can currently do. I don't know if that helps or adds to what Maria said. Like I said, in this uh, moment. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Laura. And, and thank you, Maria. Appreciate it. Uh, Maria, is there uh, one more person or anyone else on this particular docket related to coronavirus funding? I have, I have the, the Family Justice Center, which um, operates um, in conjunction with the Boston Public Health Commission and a number of other nonprofit organizations. It includes the Domestic Violence Unit, the Sexual Assault Unit, the Crimes Against Children Unit, and the Human Trafficking Unit um, is here to speak. But I didn't see Beth on the line, so I'm here. looking to see if Beth is here. Uh, Beth, are you here? I okay. don't hear you either, but what I can do... Um... Yeah, I don't see her, so I could probably um, speak to this as well. Um, Thank you, Maria. Yeah, let me just pull this out. So, as I noted, the Family Justice Group are the four police divisions that are located in the Family Justice Center. They're responsible for the police department's response in, in investigation of incidents of sexual assault, domestic oh, violence. Here they are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. No <laughs> I just saw your label as uh, FAC. So I'm going to let you take over and I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Beth Leary. I'm here on behalf of Captain Kosminski. Um, I work in the sexual assault unit and I have a sort of oversight role with HTU and Crimes Against Children. And we also have the Crimes Against Children unit um, in Internet Crimes Against Children. They're, they're one unit. We have been going strong through the pandemic. We've seen a lot of technologically related crimes increase um, through the pandemic. and. The way we've had to do business has completely changed because a lot of victims and families and parents, they don't want to come into the city and be interviewed and equipment that would, that this grant would provide would assist us. Um, we all don't have our own iPads and such. Um, and it's difficult sometimes. And also the same interviews, and that's when children are interviewed by forensic examiners, forensic interviewers. Um, that's all over Zoom now, which was never the case. 
so we've had to adjust the way we do our work, um, this very important work. And it also, I, I also need to mention that all of these units have to keep up with the technology that is out there now. Um, everyone is online, especially now during the pandemic. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, people send in inappropriate photos all over the place. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, people are at home online. It's very dangerous for children. So all of this equipment would really help us get into the mode we need to be in to, to combat some of the stuff that's going on. Um, does anyone have any questions? No, what we'll do is that's, um, Lieutenant Larry, that's very helpful and, and thank you and your team over there. I know you, know, you guys do some really challenging work, so thank you very much. Um, thank you. Just appreciate the testimony. What we'll do is go through all the counselors and who can ask any questions of all of the panelists. Okay. So thank you. Thank Marie, you. is that it or is there, um, that's it, thank you. And lastly, the last docket, it's docket 0831, which is uh, in the amount of $120,000 specifically for the Harrison Albany uh, Block Public Benefits Fund. Uh, Maria, are you gonna speak to that docket or is there someone else? Uh, Sean can speak to that docket. That was a public benefits fund. It didn't go through our office directly. So Sean will, can speak to that. Thank you, and thank you, Sean. Good morning, again. So yes, we've been working with the community. This was a, um, there's a developer, um, and when meeting with the, um, with the local res residents down there, one of the requests that had been put in was for the addition of cameras. So we were brought in with BRA and uh, um, Councilman Baker and uh, some of his staff also were, um, were in some of these meetings. And we met with the community service officers as well as many of the folks um, from the neighborhood. And we kind of, in a general sense, said, you know, this is the area that we could potentially cover. So it was, um, we had, there was one, some earmark, and then the, uh, the community wanted additional cameras put in. So that um, amount of money was brought up a little bit more. And so in conjunction with the neighborhood, we selected um, the locations that the cameras would need to be installed. And again, that would be connected to the um, Boston police um, system, which is, you know, the uh, existing system that we referenced earlier. I believe. You Thank you, Sean. Thank you. I know it's mute, unmute, mute. Um, thank you. And Maria, thank you. Did you want to add something to this docket? Yes, I, I okay. neglected to mention that Mark Lynch is the head of facilities for the Boston Police Department is also on the call and he can speak to some of the physical materials that we are going to need to have placed in our facilities. And I, I, thought, I think it's interesting uh, information. So I, I'd like to have Sean have an opportunity to speak to that. And just I mean, to be clear, Mark, this will relate to the previous docket with the emergency coronavirus funding? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Mark, um, you have the floor. Are you on? Can't see you. Mark is on. I just, I, I, I'm wondering if he can hear us. Uh, um, let me text him real quick. Sorry about that. No problem. And so while we wait for Mark and I can, oh, I think he's connecting right now. Mark, are you on? I do, Mark, are you on? I, I do see your audio connected. It looks like he's trying to connect. So what I might do is come yeah. back to Mark. What I'll do is go to my colleagues um, and then when Mark gets connected, I can go back to him. Um, so just uh, looking at and being mindful of time, I will call on my colleagues and I'll say, I'll give you guys maybe five or six minutes, try to just go through a round and then um, come back around again. So I'll go in the order of arrival. Councilor uh, Nisar Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I did have to step out. Um, I had my family homeless, uh, homeless family shelter roundtable discussion, so I had to step away for a minute. But uh, some of this conversation that I caught here just at the end came up in a discussion I had yesterday with a group of mental health providers, and that is the um, increase 
in online sexual exploitation that's been happening. So I'm not sure if that was covered at all in detail, um, but if, if it has been, just say so. But I'd love someone to talk about any of the resources of this funding, of any of these grants that may be going towards, um, towards that work. Yes, a little bit. And Maria, I can uh, have you call on folks, but I know if you or Lieutenant um, Leary or some others want to speak specifically to Councilor Asabi George's point. Yep. So, Lieutenant Leary, are you on? Because she did. Um, yep. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> can, can you speak? Can you speak to um, the, the audience? Uh, 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 Councilor Asabi George uh, had a question about the increased activity of. Did you say human trafficking or crimes against children? I believe she said on the internet the, the uptick that yeah. we have been seeing, and we were on it from the start. We, we we saw we saw the trend immediately. We put out community notification. Um, we actually got another detective assigned over here because we just didn't have enough people to handle all the tips that were coming in, um, the crime tips that were coming in. Um, so we have been on it. Um, we definitely, this grant would help us technology wise um, and give us some of the tools that we need to continue to combat this. Um, they're doing a lot of great work um, going on, getting up on um, really dangerous websites, as is our human trafficking unit, um, all these dating sites. Uh, we see it a lot, especially during this pandemic, because that's how people are communicating and, and meeting, and things go bad very, very, very quickly. Um, does that help at all? Um, yeah, no, that's yep. that's great, and I appreciate that. My, my um, the the piece in particular that I have, it's all very concerning to me when we think about any online mm -hmm. exploitation and trafficking. But in particular, around our school-aged kids, our students, um, and their reliance on technology during this time, we know that the mayor um, and BPS had given out thirty. 32,000 Chromebooks and uh, kids are on devices all day long, um, mm -hmm. whether it's schoolwork, but just to pass the time. And I'm looking at one of my kids mm -hmm. right now on his device. And I'm, you know, I'm imagining, especially with our younger people, that we're seeing an uptick in, um, in whether it's sharing inappropriate messages and images, whether it's mm -hmm. more cyberbullying, uh, certainly the increase in the sexual exploitation piece. Um, I don't know. Is there is there work happening with BPS? Um, yes, our school police unit does handle a lot of the incidents that happen um, between students um, because. There are incidents that happen between children that know each other, juveniles that know each other, and then you have, and I'm not downplaying um, um, those incidents, but then you have incidents where a complete stranger is soliciting nude photos or come meet me, and those are more handled by IPAC, the Internet Crimes Against Children and the Crimes Against Children Unit, and the BPS has a very, very large role in handling incidents between students because they know them. Um, we have had a few incidents, I believe, um, uh, with students on the Chromebooks, but I believe the Chromebooks are protected and they can't get on a lot of sites. I, I Please don't quote me on that, but I do think, because <laughs> um, I think they're monitored, but I'm not, I, I'm not positive on that, but yes, BPS, um, the school police unit is very much involved in, in helping us out with those cases, as are the district detectives. Great, um, thank you for that. And I, I appreciate I appreciate that information and the conversation, and um, especially coming on uh, coming back to this meeting a little late and knowing that some of this information was covered in my absence. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Um, at this time, I'm going to go to Councillor Flynn. And then after Councillor Flynn is Councillor Braden. Councillor Flynn? Thank you. 
Sorry, I didn't give you a heads up. Councilor Bach had to step off. No, that's okay. Thank you. Oh, we can hear you just fine. Thank you, Councilor. Um, I was listening to the conversation um, about the the tremendous work that the Boston Place is doing on in so many regards. I had an opportunity with Councilor Campbell to go to the Family Justice Center and see the exceptional work that they're doing, especially on domestic violence um, related issues. I know one of the grants was on um, the cameras in the south end, and I was in the south end last night at Peter's Park. I know it's it's further up at Franklin, um, but I know, I know the community definitely supports the cameras in that area. Council of Baker and, um, has done an excellent job on that issue. Um, but just as a, as, as a way of background, I had the opportunity to spend years working as a probation officer, and I have seen the work that the police have done on, on these issues and the cameras are critical and, um, you know, we have crime in, in our city and I think the police need the proper tools to address the um, crime in our city, but also to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure the city as, is as safe as, as possible. So again, just wanna highlight um, those issues and uh, looking forward to hearing more information about um, about the other grants as well. I had the opportunity to work with Superintendent Wilson, um, does an exceptional job as as do the other um, professionals as well. So thank you, Council Campbell, and thank you for taking um, thank you for um, allowing me to speak. Thank you, Councilor Flynn, um, and thank you for the specifics with respect to one of the dockets. Appreciate it. Um, and now, Councilor Braden, you're up, and after Councilor Braden, it's Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Braden? Thank you, um, Councilor Campbell. Um, I'm curious more, I'm, I'd really uh, be interested in coming to visit the um, Family Justice Center and, and see the work that's happening over there. Um, one particular concern of mine in, the, in this COVID crisis is the uh, incidence of domestic abuse. Um, domestic violence. Um, uh, do you have any good numbers on, on what's been happening on the ground um, in this period of time? Um, I think I can, with the submission of the grant, we had found that there were some increases. I don't have um, the increases since the grant submission, but in the narrative of the grant, I can read for you some of those increases, if you just uh, allow me. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began March 15th through May 3rd, and we can get these numbers updated for you. Um, that would be helpful. And, and, uh, domestic aggravated assault uh, increased by 27% compared to the same time period in the year before. Um, and this, have may this may have emerged as a result of stay home orders and will be monitored closely. Uh, Beth, do you have numbers with you right now that can be updated, that, that are updated numbers since March 15th to date? Unmute. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, I believe we're just about the same as we were last year. I recognize there seemed to be a little bit of an uptick in the beginning. But from what I understand, it has leveled off and our numbers are consistent um, with what they were last year. Um, we are, like I said, um, with the internet crimes and the internet stuff going on, we, we were um, on it right away. Our detectives um, are doing a great job in, in trying their best to help every person they come into contact with. Um, I can get solid numbers for you um, and rather quickly, um, but I do believe that we aren't seeing the uptick anymore. Mm -hmm. Which is good for Yeah, that's, that's very good news. Um, my one concern is perhaps in the undocumented community that there's maybe a, a resistance to reporting um, violence, uh, domestic violence, which is sort of the, the iceberg with, we might see the tip of the iceberg, but there's maybe more going on under the surface than we know about. 
Um, the other issue in terms of uh, monitoring what's going on on the internet, like uh, how, how, what's the mechanism that you use? Do you have, uh, how, how, I'm just curious how that works in terms, because I know it's, you know, in terms of monitoring, <laughs> even my own social media, it's hard to keep track of everything. Um, I just wonder what the mechanisms that you have within your department to monitor um, activity on the internet. Or is that the private um, well, information? I, well, <laughs> um, I am not in internet crimes against children, but I do know that they do do some monitoring and um, our brick does monitor social media as well, uh, not just for um, crimes against children, but for everything, um, if, if I understand correctly. Um, there are monitoring systems in place. Um, I, I really am not the one to speak on that. It's a little bit out of my league. Um, but like I said, rest assured, we, we recognize that this was a problem very early on and we put out notifications to the community and we are on it. Yeah. I think the COVID crisis has thrown things into a completely different spin and, and these, um, mm -hmm. These uh, perpetrators are very adaptive and um, and and can sh switch cr tracks very quickly and and find uh, outlets that we're not so you try and keep one step ahead of them. Right, and we see that um, all the different websites that um, people are exploited through, like you said, they do adapt. Like they back page gets taken down, and new websites come up for people to solicit sex. Um, it, it, they are very adaptive, and that's why at the Family Justice Center, we, we are really committed to keeping, keeping, um, a, you know, keeping up with the bad guys. And it, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a very serious and uh, difficult task, but we, we do our and, best. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious as well how many officers you have within your, within your Family Justice Center. This, is a, this seems like a, a very extensive palette of um, of uh, work that you have to uh, cover. Right, well, we, we're, we consist of four different units, four separate units. It's the sexual assault unit, which yeah. um, that's my, my unit. Um, we have the domestic violence unit, the human trafficking unit, and the crimes against children unit, and the internet crimes against children unit. They're, these four units comprise the Family Justice Center. Yeah, very good. Okay, I'm really curious. I'm really interested to come and visit and see your work um, sometime well, soon. Hopefully, we'll be that happy can to have you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Uh, Council O'Malley, and then I have Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I will be brief because I know we have a hard stop at 11:30, and I want to hear from members of the public. Um, but thank you all for uh, this really thorough investigation. Uh, excuse me, thorough, thorough conversation this morning. Um, and obviously, want to echo uh, the great work at the Family Justice Center. Um, you know, I, I know the incredible work was done. I know there was a, there was an absolutely uh, amazing individual from my district, G. Kennedy, who worked there, whom we lost several years ago. Um, and I know that we're going to. Um, I, I look forward to the day where we can uh, again, sort of. Uh, uh, appreciate her contributions uh, as well as so many people uh, who uh, who've worked there and, and have, who've supported so many so many Bostonians there. Um, I would begin by echoing the chair's um, call. Um, thank you. Uh, I know one of the uh, uh, administrators from BRIC had talked about having counselors come in. I've actually never been in to see it. I'd like to see it as well as the FJC, which, which I have visited in the past, um, but I also echo the chair's call that it'd be great to get some members of the community, uh, particularly some advocates here to, uh, to, help, uh, to help facilitate conversation. So, so count me in for that. Um, the five uh, civilian positions that would be paid for in docket 0408, that's just a one, year, would these be one year contracts I'd assume, given the amount of money? I don't know if this is uh, David or? Yes, hi, Counselor. Um, and uh, as with all the councils, you're, you're welcome. We'll look forward to a visit okay. with you sometime in the near future here. Um, it is uh, the funding from this earmark uh, will sustain all of those positions for a total of two years. And we have additional funding that would allow us to sustain those positions for an additional two for a total of four years. Um, four years. And where this earmark is given to us on a, an annual basis from the EOS budget, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to continue it into the future so that we have uh, fair sustainment. 
Great. And I'm sorry, you may have gone over this. And I, I, I apologize. I had to duck out. What can you just very briefly sort of detail what those positions are? Yes. So uh, five of, uh, let me just take a look at my notes here because I'm getting mixed up with some of the numbers. Uh, so four of the uh, civilian personnel would be in the BRICS real-time crime center. Um, and those folks would ultimately help augment some substantial gaps that we currently have where we have very, very limited funding um, and very limited um, staffing capability uh, as far as filling vacancies, uh, voids in the operation and such. Uh, one of them would be a supervisor. So on ships where supervision is necessary, we can make sure that we have somebody there to provide them with uh, supervisory uh, oversight and support, uh, something that I think everyone would welcome. Uh, the other uh, positions, what we're looking to do with those is uh, use those uh, in a coordinating and collaborating manner with um, a few of our local law enforcement partners, uh, specifically the Massachusetts State Police, um, the uh, transit police, as well as the uh, Massport as an agency. Um, as you're all aware, um, these organizations own a substantial and have jurisdiction over a substantial amount of property within the city of Boston. Um, that is, uh, you know, it's all equally important to us uh, from a public safety perspective. And um, the reality of the fact is, is that in those areas where they have jurisdiction, uh, we do not have very thorough insight into the crime and quality of life issues that are occurring in those areas. Uh, the seaport is a perfect example, um, something that's been brought up many times before. Um, the area along the southwest corridor, which stretches from uh, you know, the south end all the way to Jamaica Plain, um, countless highways, roadways, the Esplanade, um, the Esplanade that is uh, down in the Neponsa River area that goes from Mattapan uh, through uh, Hyde Park. There's just a lot of areas there where, uh, yes, we have great partnerships as organizations with these agencies, but what we want to be able to do is have a better analytic capability to see uh, data and information specific to criminal activity, quality of life, everything down to um, supporting the data that we need for our um, traffic analyst that is looking at pedestrian accidents and uh, vehicle crashes and people being hit on bicycles. On bicycles. Uh, we want to be able to bridge some gaps that we have um, of, uh, so that we can properly uh, analyze and advise the department for um, deployment, strategic planning purposes, um, and, uh, and improve quality of life across the city ultimately. No, that's helpful. So with these sort of cross-jurisdiction uh, communication or, or sort of uh, uh, these positions to help, to help work together, that would that be specifically for state police, uh, DCR, um, perhaps to other municipalities, and not sort of federal government? Is this specifically oh, yeah. for state? Yeah, yeah. These, these are specifically for those purposes. Um, yeah, we, we're not... We're not looking to bring in additional people that have a specific role in facilitating information sharing with our federal partners. Um, you know, ultimately, they're going to help uh, bridge the gap in analysis from everything from um, violence um, to property crimes, vehicle breaks, uh, you name it, whatever, whatever the specific issues are. And the other thing that I want to add to that is that, um, make no mistake, uh, while we are dealing with, um, you know, substantial issues with COVID, um, with violent crime that's transpiring on our streets in the city. Um, you know, terrorism still is a real issue. Um, and um, some of these agencies uh, own and operate critical infrastructure that um, is substantial and is still um, a very significant target of uh, both international and domestic terrorist organizations, uh, transit, airports, uh, the, um, the maritime waterfront area, a number of those places. And, you know, Again, we have great relationships with these agencies, but um, we want to be able to strengthen our focus in some of these areas where we see uh, vulnerabilities and higher risk uh, so that we can do a better job protecting the citizens and the visitors of the city. Thank you for that. Um, briefly, on docket 0710 the video cameras in both the South End and Bowdoin Geneva area of Dorchester. Um, I know this is separate, but the council very recently passed the facial recognition ban, something I think we proudly passed unanimously, and we're seeing some efforts across the state. I know we currently don't use that technology, and this is different from those cameras, but can you talk briefly about how any new uh, technological sort of uh, te technology such as cameras are going to be in compliance with uh, both the letter and the spirit of the ordinance that we just passed? 
Uh, I'll, this is Sean Romanowski from uh, Telecommunications Division. So, yes, we, um, I, I was at the hearings, or on the hearings, I should say, and we are very, very um, understanding of the fact that we will in no way implement facial recognition. We don't even have the technology to, and once we get the technology in, there's a separate license, a separate agreement, and uh, in no uncertain terms, I was told that we will not exercise any of those, um, those facial recognition. So we're primarily focused on what's called video summary, and this is where we take, you know, for every hour of video, we can reduce that down to typically six minutes, depends on how much activity is going on on the screen, but that's what we're focusing on when we were asking for the um, you know, analytic. That was really what we were trying for. And I was on some of the hearings and, um, you know, we would love the opportunity to educate the public on how the Boston Police actually does it. Um, we do not sit there and actively monitor cameras. We use these as some event that will bring us to look at the video, and that's typically how we use the video. Oftentimes when something happens, we don't know the time span, so they will say, hey, it happened sometime between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., and in the old days, the, an officer would actually have to fast forward through that. So the analytics we're looking for will take anything that is not movement and it will just compress it. So if a car goes by and five minutes later a car goes by, on the video it will appear that they went by, you know, 10 or 15 seconds apart. That's so yes, we are very, very clear that we will not implement it. Thank you for that, Sean. I appreciate it. Um, and then just lastly, because I said I'd be brief and I haven't been, uh, um, is there any timeline on uh, action for these uh, these four dockets? In other words, would, you know, some some dockets have sort of a sunset clause, or, or is there any timeline on the body taking action on these dockets? So as far as the um, the cameras, we have uh, we are absolutely ready to go. We're just waiting on um, the approval to accept the hundred thousand dollars for this, and the other three um, we are absolutely ready to go as soon as the money becomes available. We have um, contractors lined up. Um, I know Mark Lynch is trying to get in as well. I know that he's working on his projects, which is, the, um, you know, bring the physical separation. As far as the um, Bureau of Administration and Technology, we are prepared to move on the digital signage, the, the calls, uh, in, and the video conferencing for um, arraignment. So I get that, 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 that you'd be ready to go with passage. I I guess, is there any concern that the um, the grant would expire if we didn't take action? Is there any? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the federal government, depending on the administration at times, um, will either allow budget extensions or won't allow budget extensions. Um, so for this COVID supplement grant, uh, we have one year to typically spend it down. And if we can't spend it down within that year, They'll decide at that time if they're going to take the money back or if they're going to allow us to get a budget extension. Each okay. grant is different, um, different uh, funders. And so it really is up to the funder as to whether or not they allow extensions or not. In years past, like when we did the reentry program for many years, we would, it was easier to get a budget extension. But then when the new administration came in, they stopped giving those extensions. Um, and so I, I'd rather just do things on time um, than to hope and pray that they give us an extension uh, 12 months from now. I appreciate that, Maria. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Council Flaherty, and then Council Baker. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman, uh, for hosting the hearing. I know that we held a hearing uh, last month on on several of these dockets and we had uh, some outstanding questions. So uh, thank you to the Boston Police Department uh, for coming back to answer some of the outstanding questions and also be remiss if I uh, didn't uh, thank the BRIC for the great work they did uh, last month in the joint um, partnership between BPD and some federal agencies that led to the arrest of over 30 um, gang members, drug dealers, and they recovered, I believe, some in the vicinity, maybe about a dozen uh, illegal firearms. So uh, great work. And uh, my sources tell me that it was the intel uh, from BRIC that played a significant role uh, in uh, that led to, to, uh, to the arrest of those individuals. So I appreciate that work and appreciate your efforts in keeping our neighborhood safe and trying to get as many drugs and guns off of the streets as possible. Uh, I want to just zone in specifically on Docket 0408, questions that I had. And they're very specific. What upgrades, uh, expansions, and integrations of technology would this grant help fund? 
Um, I understand, obviously, the, the role of BRIC uh, in our city, particularly as it pertains to uh, anti-terrorism work uh, in emergency response situations, should not be lost on Boston uh, or anyone on this call that, uh, you know, Logan Airport was the launching pad uh, on September 11th, as well as the marathon bombing. So I really want to zone in on the upgrades, the expansions, and the integrations of technologies that this grant uh, will, uh, will be used for. Uh, yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so the focus um, for this grant funding that we have in front of us here um, is very limited in scope as it pertains to technology. Uh, at most, uh, we see us spending some money on maybe some additional licensing to make sure that these additional analysts have um, some of the existing tools available to use. Um, some of them are limited by licensing quantities. Uh, per seat licenses versus uh, an enterprise licensing agreement, which allows everyone to have access. You know, so we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. Um, and then, uh, depending on the willingness of uh, actual data sharing with some of these uh, these agencies, um, I know I, for one, think there would be a great benefit for us to be able to um, actually have access to some of the data that's collected from the agencies that I mentioned before, so that we can see overlapping crime patterns beyond jurisdictional boundaries. Um, I think as everybody understands here that um, uh, criminals um, and crime issues and quality of life issues, they don't, they don't have physical boundaries. Um, and we can only see as far as the information that is shared with us uh, can go uh, with any factual uh, level of, uh, of accuracy. So um, we are hopeful that we will be able to have some level of, um, of data and information sharing that fits our policies, uh, fits the um, uh, the spirit of the operation here, as well as um, the uh, the spirit of uh, the public safety efforts that we have going forward here. Again, all within policies and procedures that exist within the city of Boston. We're, we're looking for, let me just emphasize this, lawfully collected information, um, you know, uh, and, and that's the extent of it. Very good. I've obviously seen, I've received correspondence uh, in support uh, of this based on public safety from some community organizations and crime watch groups, et cetera, and I've also have received uh, correspondence uh, in opposition, um, you know, from folks like the ACLU and others concerning uh, civil liberties. So, uh, wanted to address just the gang database briefly. Um, what is the criteria by which uh, someone is on the database? Uh, how can uh, someone get off the database if they are erroneously on the database, or uh, how can they get off the database if they've demonstrated? Um, you know, the ability to be off the database. So if you can maybe just, uh, for my edification, my colleague's edification, I guess what's the process by which, um, you know, that whole database thing, uh, gang database thing works? Absolutely. So, uh, sir, the, uh, the gang database is managed by an existing uh, rule, which is a policy, uh, an overarching policy that's put together by the Boston Police Department. Um, I believe that we have put that out so we can share it with you. Um, again, just to make sure that we've got all the explicit details laid out there. Um, I don't have all the criteria sitting directly in front of me, so forgive me. I'm going to um, kind of give a high-level overview on that, and then um, I'm, I'm happy to provide more information. Again, as a, as a rule, this has been this has been put out there, so there's it's all public information. Um, so it, to get onto the gang database, um, there there's a, a, a point system that we've adopted. Uh, which essentially provides a criteria based on behaviors and activities of, of individuals. Um, uh, they have to meet um, a certain uh, set of criteria, particularly um, activity that can be defined as gang activity, which I believe off the top of my head is um, individual uh, acts of, of uh, more specifically crime and violence uh, that are taken by groups of one or more people for purposes of further, furthering the, um, the interests of the said gang. Okay, so that's kind of the first criteria, which kind of establishes the gang up front. And then beyond that, it's based on um, self-admission, um, interaction with other known and, um, and previously verified gang members, um, different types of, uh, of criminal activity that's uh, taken um, on behalf of the gang, things such as that. I believe that we have a list of, um, I want to say approximately somewhere between 10 and 13 different criteria. Each one of them has a different weighting system to that. Um, and we work uh, uh, closely with um, the uh, members of the Youth Violence Strike Force in, um, in acknowledging who these individuals are that are interacting and that are uh, getting heavily engaged in the gang, in the gang violence. Um, in terms of getting off the gang database, there is a procedure for that as well. Um, you don't stay on the gang database forever, uh, much like a lot of the information that the BRIC um, 
has uh, in its possession for intelligence purposes or for investigative purposes. Um, that information has um, uh, certain review uh, timelines to it, as well as certain uh, retention periods for it. So uh, if an individual is participating in a gang for um, a certain amount of time, uh, we'll review, get a, an update, we'll review that data, we'll, we'll look through records, and we'll determine whether or not they are still, in fact, active. If they are not active anymore, they are removed. Um, and, and that is the process pretty much um, that is grounded in a federal regulation that we adhere to. Um, so uh, that is that. As far as a procedure for finding out whether or not one is actually in the gang database, um, there's some direction that's provided through um, the, the, the department and the city's privacy policy, not the city, I apologize, the BRICS uh, Privacy, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties Policy, which allows for uh, one to make a request to determine whether or not they are in that database. Uh, but uh, what I need to be completely upfront and transparent about is that if an individual is under an investigation or um, that information is protected by certain law enforcement clauses, um, it may not be as, as straightforward to just get that information. But, um, but there are procedures that are in place that um, would allow somebody to find out whether or not that is the case. And I, and I hope that that makes sense as well because, um, you know, in the, as an agency is conducting a sensitive investigation, if somebody gets the sense that they're under investigation, um, it, it could be very, very disruptive to the actual uh, rule of law. And obviously we've seen an uptick in, in, in crime and violence. Um, I'm assuming uh, it's fair to say that uh, gangs have a, 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 a play a significant role in, in the uptick as well as, uh, do you know, a round uh, figure of estimate as I'm just um, looking at the time, Council Flaherty, just looking at the time, so I got to get through the other colleagues and public testimony, and I know. So I, I, I will, um, if you could wrap this piece up, and then I will sure. try to come back around. Thank you. Sure, I just, I just um, obviously oh, want to get an estimate of the number, of, I just want to get an estimate of the number of possible gangs. Uh, we just we just lost you, sir. Um, I, I will say that. Uh, Sorry, I just want I just want to get I just want to get an estimate of the number of possible gangs in Boston, but also as it pertains to Docket zero seven one zero, Madam Chair, just just had one question as to uh, I guess how uh, I want to know a little bit about that community process as to how Bowdoin Geneva was selected um, and uh, what was the community process like. Thank you, and I'll stand by for the answer. The gang question, uh, very briefly, I don't have the specific number, and because of the fact that we have retention, and that number changes over time, um, I, I'm very confident there are a few hundred gangs that are that are operational within the city of Boston. Maybe tough to, to swallow, but it, unfortunately, that's wow. wow. Thank you, Superintendent Carabin. And, be, and regarding the first docket, which we, uh, the docket related to Bowdoin Geneva, which we heard on June 4th, I know there was a lot of testimony then about the community process with respect to that docket. I'm just being mindful of time and wanting to get to public testimony too. Um, so Maria, if we could just follow up separately on that and Council Flaherty, we can get you details on that because there was a lot of uh, said at the previous hearing on that particular docket. With Great, to thank process. you very much. And make sure, make, you. sure that Mar make sure Maria puts in for combat pay for the last hearing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we're going on to Councillor Baker, and then after Councillor Baker, Councillor Mejia. I've also, we've been joined by Councillor Arroyo, who's been on for a little bit, and then Councillor Edwards. So I'll go to Councillor Baker, Councillor Mejia, and then Councillor Arroyo, um, and, and just try to be mindful of time. Go ahead, Councillor Baker, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first off, I just want to say, uh, speak, I, I had a question for Peter Messina, but I don't see him on there, and I can connect with Peter. I wanted to know what the, the software that they're, that they're that they're looking into to not duplicate efforts. Oh, there's Peter there. Oh, okay, yes, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, Peter, I wanted to ask about the software that you you had mentioned to not repeat efforts. Does that software does that have like um, the amount of beds, the beds that are available, detox beds, mental health beds? Is that is that the type of software? What type so, of software so the great, is it? The great thing about the software is that it's HIPAA compliant and all of our partners can be on this software program. So we can be working with um, PARI, or our recovery coaches, we can be working with BPHC, uh, and all be sharing information. So for example, if I'm working with an individual and, and I've established a plan for that individual, all of our partners who are working with this individual, this individual will know what our plan is, so we're not duplicating efforts. Um, it'll also allow us the ability to see what 
where we got where we got them at the detox and where or where they got them at the detox and establish that follow-on plan and if that detox worked or did not work so the next time uh, we have to get them to treatment we can change it from that location to a different location uh it, it provides better wraparound services so we're, we're all not working in silos but so gone are the days of sitting sitting and, and making phone calls for detox beds and and, and services sounds like, it'll sounds like sounds like a good improvement it'll streamline the effort uh tremendously and allow better communication and break down the silos uh, amongst the agencies so we can have a holistic approach moving forward for the massive gas area and citywide for that matter Thank you, Peter. You guys are doing good work down there. And I just want to mention Greg Mahoney. Greg Mahoney was one Thank of you. my members when I was the um, the uh, shop steward over at the print department. And, and basically, what Greg what Greg is doing there is is Greg. Good work. Thumbs up. Thumbs up to you. You've been working hard over there and trying to bring some in house printing back to the city. And and people could also go see what Greg does at at headquarters. Um, you know, I had I had vast knowledge on the on the printing. Um, that we used to do, and, and then what, Greg, you've done, you've, you've done a lot. So that was just a shout out to you. I want to be supportive of Greg. And, and, and more, more than anything, I want to speak on um, 0831. It's, it's something that's been going on for probably five years. We should, have, we should have had this money two years ago. These cameras should already be installed. Um, I, I'd like to thank Eddie, Eddie Council Flynn for his work in helping to advocate for this. Um, but but extensive community process, extensive um, you know walkthroughs, and where the camera is going to go. Very thoughtful. A lot of them around the the, the parks and in the playgrounds that people want to to use. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. And the last point that I want to make early on, you made a good point, Madam Chair, that these grants are not something that we can go in and mold and fashion and take money from here and put it in there. Very specific money is going to specific places. So. Thank you for that clarification early on, Madam Chair, and, and um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh, Councillor Mejia, and then we'll have Councillor Arroyo. And thanks for being so brief. Councillor Mejia, yeah, thanks thank for your you. patience. No, no, thank you all. Um, so just to keep uh, the conversation short, I'm just curious about what specific measures have been implemented by the BPD and BRIC to protect um, student safety, since in the news, that school incident reports have been made into the hands of ICE. Um, can you talk a little bit about BRIC's relationship with ICE and other federal departments more broadly? That's one question. We have still have, um, David, are you still on? Um, I, I am. Thank um, you. So uh, again, this is, a, this is a topic that, you know, we came to address the, uh, the EOPS funding provision for the accept and expend. Uh, so I don't have all of the explicit details sitting in front of me on this topic. So if I don't get into detail enough, we can uh, we welcome a, a further conversation. Um, one, I, I want to just state for the record that um, the BRICS involvement in activities that go on at the school was uh, overstated by a lot. Um, a lot of misinformation was put out both in the media um, and by other groups. Uh, and uh, as far as our uh, our relationship with uh, federal government and particularly the immigration authorities that are of great concern, which I completely understand, uh, we are entirely in compliance with the Trust Act, um, particularly the Trust Act as it has been updated. Um, we are authorized to share uh, criminal-related in, uh, information to support investigations that are uh, conducted by certain uh, groups, in particular, like. Homeland Security investigations, as opposed to uh, uh, ERO, uh, Emergency Removal Operations, which is another branch of ICE. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that we are not um, we are not engaged in supporting efforts that uh, go towards enforcement of civil immigration procedures. So thank we are not that. sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I just want to be really mindful because. Um, Councillor Campbell is keeping us on a little timer here. <laughs> Dave, I really want to make sure that I get through all of this, but I do want to follow up really quick. The student um, that was identified um, not too long ago as a gang member, I'm just curious about, um, and he was also deported because of that, and this grant will fund expanding anti-gang protocol. So can you just kind of elaborate on kind of like that point, please? I'm not sure I understand the question, ma'am. So the question so the is, individual that was, the, individual. the individual that was um, 
uh, I think his name, I forget what his name was. I know his father's name was Ulysses. And so the situation was that, that uh, there was a student in East Boston that was identified as a quote unquote gang member. And he I'm, was I'm familiar with the, I'm very yeah. familiar with, with, so, with that. Um, oh, so. But this particular grant um, will fund the expanding, you know, expanding anti um, gang protocol. So I'm just trying to figure out what and how we're going to combat gang violence while at the same time um, keeping our kids safe. Sure. So um, an example would be if there's a uh, gang activity that's happening along the Southwest Corridor um, between south, the South End and uh, Jamaica and places in Jamaica Plain. Let's use that as an example of a property where we've seen activity take place, whether it's uh, firearms activity or other gang activity. Uh, we would want to make sure that we can share that information, uh, that we receive the information in the first place. Um, if another agency is responsible for responding to that activity, uh, collecting information on that activity, uh, we want to make sure that we're aware of that because let's call it spade a spade, let's call it what it is here. You know, it's some of these areas where the where they're um, where they have jurisdiction is a matter of a hundred yards wide, um, and then it, that activity spills right over into the neighborhoods of our of uh, the other areas of the neighborhoods of the city. Um, yet that's an, an existing gap in activity. Thank you and then, so I'm just curious about how this grant will be used. Um, I know that it will be used to combat gang violence, but I'm also curious how would this um, be used to combat implicit bias in our system? Uh, I, I guess I'm not prepared to answer to answer that question. What I would say is that these um, the individuals that we will be looking to hire will be put through rigorous training. Um, we have high standards for qualifications for individuals that get hired. I will tell you that um, analytic bias is a significant problem that we aim to avoid um, as a profession. Um, people are trained in educated and analytic methodologies which are intended to take analytic bias out or any types of other um, implicit bias out of the equation. Um, so I would rest on training and education as being the number one way to make sure that that is avoided. Thank you. And then I'm just uh, may, I, this, may I interject? Uh, absolutely. May I interject? Thank you, uh, Superintendent Chuck Wilson. Uh, Councilwoman, I, I testified um, along with my, my colleague from the Bureau of Investigative Service, Services before the City Council. Uh, we wholeheartedly embraced the Trust Act. Uh, we didn't uh, look to um, change it at all. We had no issues with it. Um, we were in a, a total agreement with it, and I did testify to the fact my former role as the commander of the Domestic Violence Unit for many years, um, I often uh, signed U visa applications uh, in favor of victims um, of domestic violence who weren't legally here. So I think that we have more commonality um, with the Trust Act in terms of how we feel about it than some people may uh, suspect we do. I just wanted to let that be known to all your listeners out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then the last thing is that I'm also really curious. Um, I know Fatima early on asked the questions about whether, I mean, I'm just curious if I'm on this just because, you know, the database of known terrorists. And I'm just curious, is it, we're also looking at su white supremacists. Um, how are we classifying them um, as known terrorists who are terrorizing communities of color? I mean, if so if we're going to be having this conversation, I think just for the record, it's important to, to, to hear from you all in terms of how you're defining who is a terrorist these days. Absolutely. So uh, let me just make a note that the gang database is not used for terrorist purposes. Uh, we have other systems that are used for that. Um, but you are absolutely right. We, we are dealing with a variety of different types of, uh, of right wing, um, uh, violent extremist groups that are operating in the United States. Um, we have drawn attention to those groups as we've uh, had concerns over attendance at um, events, activities, uh, different things that have impacted the city of Boston. Um, we treat them the same exact way that we would treat any other type of terrorist organization. They present a very, very substantial and significant threat to the city of Boston, not only there, but to the, uh, you know, the, the country as a whole. Um, and I want to make sure that that is not discounted at all. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, terrorism has no color, no race, no ethnicity. 
It is a behavior. It is an activity. It is formed off of certain ideologies and intent to impose significant harm and political change in areas that where, you know, frankly, there's argument to be made that they're not going about it the right way, right, through criminal activity. And we treat them all equally. We have concerns about that. But, again, the gang database is intended for gang purposes. It has a purpose that's limited there. So, and you're not, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And I just wanted to say thank you. I know that, you know, being under these circumstances and asking all of these questions, you know, may feel like we're putting you in the hot seat. But we really do appreciate you being so forthcoming with the information. And, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, this is a partnership. It's really important for us to be well-versed in what you do. And our role as city councilors is to help inform those that we serve so they can better understand the role that you all play in our safety. So I do appreciate the time that you have taken. And I yield the rest of my time, which I probably don't have any more left. Right, Campbell? Go on ahead. Thank you, Council Mejia. And I will say, Superintendent Wilson and Carabin will send an email with all the questions that came up and have a long list to you guys. And we'll circle back with colleagues on the council with respect to those questions that are outstanding, because there are many. And so you have an opportunity to respond. And I will also add, we'll follow up on sort of a meeting with respect to the BRIC and specific stakeholders to even have a more robust conversation, because we're not going to answer all these in such a short hearing. I now have Councilor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So let me just try and take this docket by docket as quickly as I can here. Docket 0831, that's for cameras, correct? That's the, just so the folks listening, that's the Harrison Avenue Block Benefit Fund? That's right, that's right. And so those are for cameras in the South End? Correct. And can I just ask, whichever one of you knows the answer to this, a BRIC and BPD are on the phone. So just, do we have an accounting for how many cameras we have in each neighborhood? Do we have a location and accounting for the number? No, I know the location of every camera, but I haven't actually assigned the, are you talking districts? You know, the police districts, which districts have it? No, no, I mean literally neighborhoods. I mean, how many cameras are in West Roxbury as opposed to Roxbury? How many cameras are in Hyde Park as opposed to Mattapan? How many cameras are in South Boston as opposed to, you know, South End? I mean, specifically, when we talk about neighborhoods, how many cameras are in each one? I have the number by district, but I would have to do a little work, but I could certainly get that to you. So in the interest of time, if you send that via- You can follow up on that, Councilor Arroyo. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. I think that's a good way to just see if we're dispersing these cameras in a way that is inequitable or doesn't make sense in terms of just the sheer number of cameras in one location. The second thing I want to kind of touch on is the docket 0408, which is the $850,000 grant for BRIC. I believe I heard you tell Councilor O'Malley that this is specifically for city and state agencies and not for ICE? Yes, I mean, it's specifically for the city of Boston. And we have, there's no direct intention to do anything with this that would tie into ICE. You know, yeah, that's the simplest way to put it. So yes, I believe what you said is correct. Okay, so because I'm a lawyer, language is really important for me. And so when I hear direct intention, what I'm hearing is there's no guarantee that ICE won't have access to this at some point, right? There's no, there's no exclusivity. Councilor, let me be crystal clear. ICE does not have access to a drop of data that sits within the Boston Police Department, period. They don't have access. Nobody has direct access except for BPD employees. And we have a very, very small number, which we've spoken to in the past, of partners that are, that sit within the BPD framework that have access to them. And ICE is not one of them. And any information that does get shared with ICE is going to be 100% compliant with what we've agreed to and what we believe in. That's the key piece to this. What is in the Trust Act? We will stay true to that.
Hi there. Sorry, I had a disconnect okay. there. So you, I won't make you repeat your answer because I can I can go back and see it. Um, but is it fair to say the answer to that wasn't no? What? When you um, just what, so what here, I just said. So here's so the reality. Me, this is sort of a, yeah. So, so you must have. Did you miss everything that I said, sir? Yes, miss every single piece of it. So I'm just trying to figure out it, because for me, if the, the answer was no, it wouldn't have been as as long. I was trying to get the audio in. But was the answer no that ICE doesn't have access in any way, shape, or form to any of this material? ICE does not have access to any data that we have access to. One thing I want to point out so that what I'm saying is not misleading in the slightest bit is ICE has a valid criminal investigation that has nothing to do with civil administrative uh, responsibilities, such as identifying an individual who is here illegally. Um, that is subject to the laws that are in place for immigration violations, right? As long as, long as that's not part of what it is that's under, that's under investigation, um, we, as a law enforcement department, the Boston Police Department, which the brick falls within, um, we do share information with those agencies. So what would be fair to say is that if ICE has a valid uh, criminal investigation that is ongoing and they request information, and the person who picks up the phone when they're requesting that information is one of these individuals we hire. Um, if what ICE requests is approved by a supervisor to be shared in the spirit of the Trust Act and all other rules, policies, and procedures of the Boston Police Department, then yes, there could be information shared with ICE. But ICE does not have the ability to go filtering through databases that we have and we protect here within the city of Boston and the Boston Police Department. I think that that's I just wanted yeah, to so I get that. it. So basically, you're saying independently, they don't get to do that. They have to work in partnership with you to do that. That is correct. Okay. Uh, and it would have to be that for. It would have to be for those specific reasons that um, that are authorized. So they would have to be essentially, from what you just said, if somebody's, uh, you know, being investigated for deportation purposes from ICE, they'd have to call you. And then they'd have access to this based on the fact that they're trying to deport a specific individual? No, no. So if they're investigating something specifically for deportation, that would be a violation of the Trust Act, and we would not share that information. However, if ICE was investigating somebody for human trafficking, drug smuggling, weapon smuggling, um, a variety of fraud issues that are affecting us, um, then yes, information might be shared in those circumstances. But they would have to have a valid criminal investigation that fits the rules and, and the policies behind that. And what's the criteria for determining if ICE has a valid criminal investigation? Do they self-report that? How, how does that work? Yeah, if they don't self-report it in the process of requesting it, we seek that information out. And, but what, what do you seek? What actually makes that, what, what's, the, what's the confirming information that you would need to get from ICE? It would be a valid law enforcement purpose for a criminal investigation that does not apply to... No, no, I, I get what they have to give you in terms of a reason. What I'm asking is what is the proof that you're requesting from ICE to confirm that reason? Is it simply ICE saying we are investigating yes. this person for human trafficking? Is that it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's, that's right. So, if, I, so that's if, ICE, right. If, if ICE called you and said we are, we are investigating this person for human trafficking, you would mm -hmm. then say... Did they clear the barrier? We're done. Here's access to what you're asking for. There would be, we would ask some, uh, some questions about the investigation. Sometimes, you know, you got to understand something that we, we may not get all of the explicit details of what that, that is. Um, but yeah, we, we would trust that as a law enforcement partner that what they're telling us is the truth. And the reality, the fact is, is if what they're telling us is not the truth, that'll be the last time information is ever shared with them. And they treasure the uh, and value the relationship that we have for information sharing enough that they're not going to lie about what it is that they're asking for that information for, for. And if they do, then they will no longer receive a single thing from us, period. That'll be the end of it. And we reserve the so, right to do that. So in other words, it's simply just, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and we won't get into, you know, politicizing one way or the other on that, but I, I just don't find ICE to be particularly trustworthy. Uh, so when we talk about the gang database really quickly, uh, I have the BPD Rule 35, 335 gang assessment on it. Uh, I'm actually looking at it right now. It says six to nine points will result in a person being identified as a gang associate. And I'm seeing on the bullet points that being a victim or targeted by a gang is worth eight points if not in custody or incarcerated and three points if in custody or incarcerated. And so in other words, you can gain points on our gang database system, enough points to actually become known as a gang associate for being the victim or target of a gang? 
So let me qualify that. Nothing goes into the gang database without analysis that surrounds what goes in. As I stated during one of our last hearings, um, I will repeat the fact that this is not an automated process. There is not a machine that picks data up and places people into the gang database. We have uh, individuals that are trained um, and have very, very solid expertise that they've gained over time here uh, with uh, analyzing the dynamics of the gang activity within the city of Boston. They would evaluate information that might result in a recommendation for someone to be added to the gang database. And if that person perhaps was a, a targeted, um, if we had solid information that indicated that that person was targeted specifically for gang purposes, then that might help elevate somebody um, in how they get evaluated to get put into that database. But that does not mean that if a gang person shoots an innocent, a known gang member is arrested and, and proven guilty for shooting an innocent victim, that that innocent victim is going to just get placed into a database. That would be absurd. Um, that's where the analysis comes in, and that's where it is very, very important that we have intelligent analysts that are working here that understand, um, you know, they don't want to violate somebody's privacy, civil rights, or civil liberties. Trust me on that. I know it might be hard to, but please trust me on that. Uh, bad information going into a system is going to result in bad outcomes, and we want to make sure that the best information goes into systems like this. Uh, and so, just to be clear on that, when you say that there's sort of this uh, totality of the circumstances analysis that happens, does any of that analysis make it into the gang database, or is it simply the the description of determination that this person is a gang associate or gang member? In other words, if you have a victim or target of a member or, a, or of a gang and, and there's a conversation or a police report or an investigation that leads you to believe that this person is actually gang affiliated themselves, do you put that information into the gang database or is it simply the determination that this person is a gang member or associate that makes it into the gang database? Council, um, I'm gonna have to, you know, Superintendent, I definitely want you to answer the question, but I'm mindful of time because we had some hard stops for folks and I wanna get absolutely. half of the public testimony. So I will do some follow up. This is in line with a lot of other questions too. So Superintendent, if you could answer this question and then um, Council Royal, we will follow up because there's other questions too that I have to send over and we'll be scheduling a follow up meeting with Brick. Just have to be mindful of hard stops. And then I also- Yeah, absolutely. To Thank you, Council Royal. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, I kind of missed some of the question that was asked, Councillor. I apologize, it broke up on my end over here. Um, some information does get carried over in, um, in some of uh, the notes from what was uh, taken when an individual was verified. Um, but it's not, I don't believe it's always the case. Um, I did not come prepared today to speak um, at this level of detail on the gang database, so please forgive me for that. I, I had intentions on speaking to the subject at hand, which is the accept, accept and expend of the money from EOPS. Um, but we absolutely can have a conversation with you about that. I don't want to leave you thinking that I'm ducking the question by any means. We no, 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 that makes sense. I, not having, I, I prefer you be right than you be, than you be quick. That's it. You <laughs> no, know, this, and is the, this is recorded and on the record, and I guarantee that little clips from this are going to be out there publicly, and I just don't want... Nope, I, I respect that. Action. I'd rather, I'd rather the information be correct than, than just be given. Uh, and thank so... You. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate, appreciate that. that. Uh, thank you, so thank you for Royal. answering that. I'll, I'll, I'll see whatever time if I had any left. Uh, no, so but thank, thank you. For your <laughs> God bless you. But no, what, what I will do, just to be clear to other colleagues too, there's a long line of questions on ICE, gang database, budget. There's a long list of questions we'll follow up with. And I'm committed to not only sending those questions, which we've already sent some actually to Neil and, and IGR to get to you, David and Superintendent Wilson, but also to schedule up a follow-up time in terms of an in-person meeting to have even more robust discussion with respect to this because we never have enough time. Um, and obviously just sending questions and getting responses isn't always effective. So thank you. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I know that there are so many uh, questions that I, I know have already been asked and I apologize for anything to repeat. I, I assume my questions will also need to be added to the list. So if you don't have a direct answer right now, I'm just putting it out there. Uh, for, also, I just want to say hello, uh, Superintendent Wilson. Uh, we, we met before in the North End, and you also came to my office. So I wanted to acknowledge that uh, specifically to talk about the Trust Act. So thank you. Um, that being said, I do have some quick questions to follow up and make sure I'm clear. Uh, one, 
uh, you mentioned um, the, um, this is to, to David, you had mentioned the, uh, the, that ICE must present a valid, uh, what is it, criminal investigation to the BPD uh, in order to get access to any information. I appreciate that. So could you tell us how many on an annual basis, how many valid criminal investigations ICE presents to the BPD? Uh, not off the top of my head, I could not. No, 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 no. I, remember, I, I'm, I'm adding this to the list oh, of yes. questions. I, I, uh, if yes. you don't know off the top of your head. And okay. I'll have some yes. thank you. I'm just gonna try and be brief and get to the, the, the list of questions. I'm also curious, um, we mentioned, uh, I think uh, Superintendent Wilson mentioned some uh, U and T visas. I'm curious also how many um, times, uh, I don't know if it's not necessarily brick, but the BPD is uh, part of signing and helping to get uh, U, U, UNT visas. If it's not brick, fine, then this would just go to BPD. Very well. Was, um, it's, it's, it's BPD, it's, it's mostly, uh, not mostly, but- Domestic violence. Uh, a, a lot of it was domestic violence driven. Yes, okay. there were victims okay. of domestic violence, yes. Okay, um, and then I'm curious about, uh, with the gang database, and I apologize if these questions have already been asked, to add to the list. Um, I understand that the, the criteria for what gets you on the database and the point system is public as Councilor Arroyo uh, went through that. What is, is there anything public or is there any process to get you off the list? So, uh, forgive me, I, I'm, I'm losing the word. There's a word for this that exists within, um, with our, it's, a, it's a redress process essentially is what it comes down to. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna add are, that to the list too because Councilor Mejia I think had a similar question very well. That, um, as well, along with some others. So it's on the list. Okay. So, so I'm, I, well, then very well. The previous testimony, it wasn't as a, um, extensive because obviously I think David didn't have, um, didn't come prepared for this particular piece, but we'll add that to mm -hmm. the list as well. Okay. And just adding to the list, then how many people on average on an annual basis are added to the list? How many people are taken off the list? about how long does a person's uh, name stay in the gang database? Um, and at, uh, is there any public process or petition once I find out if I'm on the list for me to personally request that I get off? These are all questions I have to be added to the list. Okay. Perfect, thank you, Councilor. Thank you, thank you, Councilor Campbell. Um, I, Was that it, do you have brief. more? Do you have, do you have um, more? Yeah, so I, you can I, email them to, to me and Michelle or just to me and we can send them to Michelle and, and yeah. in one place. Yeah, I'm cognizant. I, I came in late and, I, uh, and I, I understand I'm extending the process. So I do want to respect everyone's time. I will email those questions, Councilor Campbell. Perfect. And I will, um, well. just so the folks in the public know and also folks on the, the discuss panel here, we'll send those, we'll follow up. But again, we'll push the in-person conversation and try to do it in such a way that we're not violating open meeting law so that mm. it's more productive, it's more back and forth, and including with some of the, the advocacy organizations that are participating too. So I'll keep everyone posted with respect to that. I wanna Thank go you. to public testimony. Um, Michelle, I'm gonna have you guide that because I think you have the current list of who signed up and who might still be uh, on. So I'll have you uh, start with the first person and just remind folks that public testimony is limited to two minutes. And I apologize, um, the hearing went a little bit longer than we originally anticipated. Michelle, if you wanna call the first person. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the first person signed up on the list is David Stone. Hi, thank David. you. Oh, go ahead. Hi, thank, hi, Madam Chairwoman. Um, thank you. I'm David Stone. I'm a 24-year resident of the South End uh, and president of the Blackstone Franklin Square Neighborhood Association, which represents people who live in the part of the South End that the cameras in docket 0831 would actually cover. Um, I'm here to express our organization's strong support for this docket and for the camera deployment. Uh, and that's based on substantial discussion among our members, including uh, two meetings last fall and a formal vote of our members in November 2019. I'm asking as you consider whether to accept this grant that you think about three things. First, for those of us who actually live in the neighborhood where these cameras would be placed, um, this, the need for them is real, it's immediate, and it's personal. Um, on the night of July 4th, uh, around 1 a.m., there was an incident, a gunfight that started on the corner of East Brookline Street, went down St. George, and then onto East Newton Street. Um, two individuals shot one another. There were numerous uh, bullets recovered, two guns. That occurred one block from where I'm sitting. 
and it ended up happening uh, under the, the uh, window of a good friend of mine. I can think of just myself, five incidents since we've been talking about this deployment last summer where there have been shots fired or people shot within three or four blocks of where I'm sitting right now in the South End. So this, this, we, there have been questions raised about uh, cameras and privacy, et cetera. Those are important questions to ask uh, and think about, but please understand this is a very real and immediate issue for us and I haven't heard any other solution except this. And I will note that Captain Sweeney said that in each of the instances I mentioned, the five or six, had these cameras been in place, there would have been valuable investigative images captured almost certainly. Uh, the second point I'd like to make, and this was, made, this was uh, stressed earlier by Councillor Baker, there's no city taxpayer funds being used here, and there's no question that public money is being diverted from some other potentially more worthy purpose. Obviously, there is a conversation going on right now in our city, in our society, about how best to deploy public resources and maybe to shift things around, and that, that's an important discussion to have, but that's not salient here. This is, this is money coming out of a private developer's mitigation uh, fund that's earmarked for a very small geography here in the South End for very particular purposes, including at the public's request, public safety cameras. Uh, so I just and I further like to stress that there's actually enough money in this, uh, this mitigation fund such that even after uh, the uh, funding of this grant, if you indeed improve it, two thirds of the, two -thirds of the money will still be available for other uses. Uh, so it's not, it's not going exclusively to this. Then the final point I'd like to stress uh, is just the level of community process and engagement that's occurred here. And again, and uh, I think uh, Sean Romanowski noted this, this docket would not be before you today, but for the fact that at an IAG process, the community process around the, the construction of the Harrison Albany block, residents here in the South End said they wanted specifically some of the mitigation money to be used for public safety cameras, and that's the genesis of, of why we're here today. Um, as I said, we further had a uh, significant amount of community engagement and discussion last fall, including two member meetings of our organization, uh, at which Councillor Baker, Sean Romanowski, uh, and a project man manager from the BPDA explained in detail um, what was proposed. They took questions. We then had a second discussion at a subsequent meeting, a very robust discussion, um, where many members were extremely enthusiastic from the outset, but others raised some questions, including privacy um, and similar concerns. So I, want to, I want the council and the committee to know that our support as an organization came about in that context. We, 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 heard, we heard facts, hard questions were asked, opinions were expressed, we weren't unanimous, but overwhelmingly our sentiment was this should go forward because it's important to our neighborhood. So I'd simply ask the committee that this to consider uh, accepting this grant. It's a rare opportunity for the South End to be materially safer uh, for all its residents and to do so without tapping city resources on which there are so many other calls. Thank you. Thank you, David. Michelle, have you called the next person? Thank you, Councillor. The next um, I have signed up it are Mallory Honora and Ramilda Pereira from Families for Justice Plus Healing. I see a Justice Healing tag, so I'm going to move you in now. Um, and you can unmute yourself. Hi, this is Mallory Honora. Did you want me to go first? So I don't see another person. Um, I didn't see Ramilda. Okay, I think she's logging in now. So I'm happy to okay. get started. Great. Um, great, so um, good morning, afternoon. Uh, my name is Mallory Hinora and I'm with Families for Justice as Healing and we are asking the city council to reject the grants to the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, including the $850,000 from EOPS, as well as the grants for cameras in the two different neighborhoods that would increase the surveillance of predominantly black and brown people. We're organizing to stop the most harmful and racist programs and practices of the Boston Police Department, which must include stopping the flow of money from state, city, and federal sources into the brick. We need to be shrinking the roles, responsibilities, and resources for the BPD. The BPD must not get more outreach vehicles, more equipment, more technology, 
The BPD should absolutely not be using software that has anything to do with people accessing drug treatment and recovery, especially when residents who have been, been very clear with the city council that we don't need police involved in public health issues like overdoses and mental health crises. We know that information about people seeking services and support, including victims of violence, through programs like those offered by the Boston Public Health Commission is already being shared with the police and managed by the BRIC. An officer just testified today about info sharing between people seeking recovery and the officers who continue to arrest them for simple possession. This should be terrifying to us. We want police to be siloed from healthcare. We want as many barriers between cops and providers as we can get. We want cops out of healthcare and mental health care. These partnerships do not have a public safety benefit. In fact, they expose community members to constant contact with law enforcement and the unending threat of punishment. If the city council is proposing to consider an alternative to 911, but can't figure out how to get the cops out of people's recovery plans, we have a major problem. The Boston Regional Intelligence Center has not, does not, and will not create safety in our communities. Brick exposes black and brown residents to constant criminalization and recriminalization. People continue to be targeted, surveilled, stopped, and searched because information about them is still in the database years after they've served their sentence and returned back to their community. Cities across the country are shutting down their ga da gang databases because of the clear presence of racism and the absence of any public safety benefit. And BPD never ever comes prepared to discuss it. And I've been coming to these hearings for years. The data that the BRIC analyzes, the analysts they wanna hire, those are people to watch and track and oversee Boston residents. The data is obtained by watching people where they live, invading people's privacy, and interrogating people to, who are trying to get from place to place in their own neighborhoods. Does the city council understand the path of information back and forth between black and brown residents to, to brick, from neighborhoods to brick? Some of the flow of that information is facilitated by the most notorious unit in the city, the gang unit. It is indisputable that BPD targets black people most often for observations and interrogations. And according to the BPD, 43% of the time, officers don't have reasonable suspicion nor probable cause to stop people. A fusion center with the purpose of collaborating with federal agents is bad for Boston residents. In the last six months, the Trump administration rolled out Operation Relentless Pursuit and Operation Legend, funded by tens of millions of dollars toward increasing the number of local law enforcement officers and a mandate to increase federal law enforcement presence in democratic cities. The Trump administration is talking openly about hunting down lawless urban residents coded language for black and brown people, grossly sensationalizing increases in violence using the worst kind of racist rhetoric with no solutions or investments other than the brute force of the militarized federal government. Congress recently passed the HERO Act with $300 million for policing. The Senate is currently considering the so-called Justice Act, which would authorize $7 billion more federal dollars for policing. And just two days ago, Mayor Wall signed a letter to Congress criticizing the deployment of federal officers in cities and asking for language and funding legislation that would stop taxpayer dollars for being used for this purpose. How dare us say, send a letter to Congress, yet fail to stop our own state's dollars from funding collaboration with the exact same federal law enforcement agencies at the BRIC? How dare us look at what's happening in Chicago and Portland, but fail to scrutinize the Fed's role here in Boston? We don't even know if the FBI agents work inside the BRIC on a daily basis. AG Barr was just here shaking hands with our very own police commissioner. ATF and the FBI just ransacked people's homes and dozens of our community members, some of them who are barely adults, others of them fathers of young children, were ripped out of their homes in two federal raids in the past couple months. And largely, those were on conspiracy charges. So people doing uh, unimaginable federal time, um, not found with anything, and being roped up and swept up by these large-scale federal investigations happening right out of the brick. So the brick should not exist at all to facilitate this kind of tracking and targeting and nonstop harassment of Boston residents. And until we get there, the city council must use its power to deny the brick any additional resources. And I just wanted to say I'm very well aware that this money can't be used for other, person, uh, other purposes, but it really saddened me uh, to see another white resident talk about not seeing any other solutions to violence than cameras. Um, Families for Justice as Healing, black and brown residents have been leading processes to transform harm, have been working on community-led solutions to violence 
funds, and we will continue to demand community-led funds for this type of community-led violence prevention that cannot be accomplished by the BRIC, it cannot be accomplished by cameras, and it cannot be accomplished by the BPD. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, Michelle, uh, Councilor Campbell, get the Councilor next Campbell, person. Yes. Can I just can I just state that there is an, an ounce of truth in what was just stated about the Boston Regional Intelligence Center? That was very misleading information about what we do and what we David, how we how we operate. David, yes. I hear you, but uh, this is public testimony. I don't even allow. And during public testimony, there's no question and answers. These are folks from the public who have, frankly, a short period of time. In this instance, two minutes to share their perspective from their vantage point. So I want to be respectful of that. I want to be mindful of that. But why I think it's critically important post this hearing to have conversations where the brick is on the opposite side of the table or in a round table with some of these community-based organizations who have a different perspective based on legitimate concerns they hear, similar to what we hear. They don't all, you know, our concerns that we get from our residents don't all line up, they're not all the same. So I just wanted to, to be mindful of the fact this is just allowing a public to testify, to give us information, and then I'm moving on. Thank you, Superintendent. Yeah. Thank you, Mallory. Um, Michelle, can we call the next person? I don't have the list. Yes, thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Um, so I still don't see Ramilda, um, so I'm gonna go to Emily Leung. I'm moving you into the room now. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, Emily, you're up, we've got a couple of minutes, thank you. Okay, perfect, I will try very hard to be brief. I know that we are uh, far over time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to the City Council for holding this follow-up meeting. I really appreciate that the BRIC was here today for this meeting to answer questions, and also thank you so much to the City Councilor for all of their questions. Um, just My name is Emily Lung. I am a supervising immigration attorney at the Justice Center for Southeast Massachusetts. So um, I am here to also speak in opposition to disbursement of additional funds to the BRIC. Um, I came to learn about the BRIC from a very specific lens of working with immigrant youth. Um, I received a call from a colleague uh, back in the fall of 2017 telling me that her client had been arrested by plainclothes officers from his home. Um, he was a child who was enrolled in high school at East Boston High School, and she did not know where he had been taken or who had taken him. After following up with East Boston Police Department, they informed her that he had been arrested by ICE and put in ICE custody. And so from there, we uh, discovered that in his immigration proceedings, she was presented with a packet that was compiled by the Homeland Security Investigations, but it included information and gang assessment verifications from the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. And that's how I personally, as an advocate, came to learn about the Boston Regional Intelligence Center and about the gang database. Um, the information included in that verification uh, is based on Rule 333 BP rule, which was discussed previously, and it included things such as social media photos, reports made by Boston school police officers about the individual's associations with other members in the community or other students that were allegedly gang members as well. Based upon that information, that individual was deported. Um, he was denied relief that he was otherwise eligible for based on those allegations. And so I just wanted to share the real world impact of this information that is out there that is being shared. I understand that the BRIC has stated that ICE does not have direct access to that information. Um, my best guess is that the Homeland Security Investigations stated that they believe this individual to be involved in a gang and that they were investigating that person for a gang. But the reality is that they use that information in civil immigration proceedings for the purposes of supporting that individual, and that is what happened. Um, so, as I said, we've been involved in uh, litigation to try to get answers to a lot of these questions, and I'm very curious to also get more answers to these questions because there is an impact here um, that is happening in the community based on this data sharing of which there is not sufficient information. Um, I, I, there are many other things that I would like to share, but I just wanted to share that story of the human impact of some of these things and be mindful of my time. So. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will follow up with additional written testimony and questions. Thanks. Emily, thank you. And we'll follow up and be in touch as well. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, yes. call the next person. Thank you. 
Next up is Elizabeth Badger. Let me you know. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Elizabeth Badger. I'm a senior attorney at the Pair Project, which represents non-citizens throughout Massachusetts. And I've represented the Latino community of Greater Boston for, I would say, more than 10 years. And I'd like to explain why the BRIC cannot continue to receive funding, given its unlawful and discriminatory practices that have resulted in detention and deportation of many young people that I've represented. So presently, young Central American youth, because of the neighborhood they live in, their nationality, acting their age, kids embracing popular clothing styles, are profiled as gang members. The reports are then collected in the BRIC and accessed or disseminated, um, as my colleague just mentioned, to ICE to justify the detention and deportation of a young person. And I'm gonna get a little legal here, but I think this is a really important point to understand. So the BRIC as a law enforcement fusion center is subject to the regulations in 28 CFR part 23 that state that the entity, and this is quoted, shall collect and maintain criminal intelligence information concerning an individual only if there is a reasonable suspicion that the individual is involved in criminal conduct or activity and the information is relevant to that criminal conduct or activity. So now I'm gonna read you reports that came out of the brick to justify the detention of my clients. These are read in their entirety with personal information eliminated. So the label here, MS-13 FIO, which stands for Field Investigation Observation. Officers observe student A walking with student B and student C into the cafeteria. Officers obtained student C's Facebook page and found two pictures of her. It's another report labeled School Police Database MS-13 Intelligence Report. Officers have observed student A, student B, and student C on several occasions, hanging with younger MS-13 associates during school hours and leaving together after dismissal. These members have been identified as student D, E, F, and G. So these two examples, which there are many more, show that police are sending, and BRIC is unlawfully capturing, information about young people that is not alleging any reasonable suspicion of criminal conduct and doing nothing but criminalizing them uh, with unsubstantiated labels. So the BRIC then goes on to, to operate this point system has been described that's itself unlawful because it allows all kinds of observations that don't allege any criminal conduct to be allocated points. So in the examples I just gave, each young person would be afforded two points when they're seen together. And 10 points, which could easily be accumulated in a single day, earns them the title of gang member in the BPD BRIC databases, even when there is a, never a single allegation of even a suspicion of criminal conduct. And I've represented many young people who have been detained and deported without a single allegation of criminal conduct. So the BPD rules themselves promote unconstitutional stops and criminalizations that the regulations prohibit. And the last trend that I just wanna very quickly highlight here is how the profiling by the BRIC impacts the education of our young people. So I would say almost without exception, the young people I've represented have been detained by ICE based on BRIC profiles where those profiles originated from school policing. So one of my young, one of my young clients who we know has been identified in BPD BRIC databases was attending high school, supporting himself at night as a dishwasher in another area of town. He would take the train home after work to Maverick Station. Routinely, he would be stopped coming out of the T He'd be forced to stand there while officers flip through database face pages um, and found their, his face on their phone or tablet and then searched him in his backpack. And just to note, like his age and historical experience with police in his country of origin informs him that it's not safe to tell police no and walk away. So it caused him so much fear that he decided instead to use a decent percentage of his nightly income to take an Uber home. He was losing so much money on Uber to avoid these baseless searches that he needed more hours at work to pay his rent, which ultimately led him to drop out of school. And so while this young person hasn't yet been detained by ICE, he has been driven out of school. And so I would submit that you know, based on the illegality of the information captured, the discriminatory practices, and the effect of deprivation of education on our young people because of how BRIC 
and BPD guidelines promote over policing of schools and students, these grants should be declined. And I will also be following up with written testimony and would be happy to, happy to speak further. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I'm going to end with, I believe, Stephen Fox, who was the last person to testify. Um, we technically had a hard stop on this hearing at 1130, so I apologize to others. But that being said, please email the committee uh, testimony if you have it. We are continuing to receive testimony in written form, and we are adding that to um, the the file in the record. And so, Stephen, I'm going to let you go, and then I'm going to follow up offline with other folks from the public testimony space um, in terms of additional questions and uh, a meeting and in, in, in time with respect to specific brick issues. Thank you. Stephen, you have the floor. Great. Uh, th thank you, Councillor. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yes, great. Thanks. Uh, just so just so I can identify myself, uh, uh, I chair the South End Forum. <clears throat> which represents 15 independent neighborhood associations of the South End. And I want to simply address uh, 831, which is, of course, the cameras. Uh, David Stone spoke eloquently about where we came from in terms of this, but uh, Councillor Baker mentioned that this has been a five-year journey, which it really has. Um, but I want to specifically address how inclusive it was. Uh, the people at the table included um, the folks from Villa Victoria, from IBA, from neighborhood associations, not just David's at Blackstone, but others abutting the, the areas that became part of our problem places in terms of shootings. Um, and we worked with the police department, we worked with Maloney Properties, we worked with Longwood Security, we worked with all of the neighborhood associations strictly in an effort to find vehicles that we would hope could help to stem the violence. The cameras are one piece of our entire agenda. We have taken back a couple of parks that had become headquarters for gang activity. And we've done that by programming in those parks and working with neighbors and neighborhoods. So this isn't just about cameras and not finding alternative solutions to violence in our neighborhoods. It's about providing a multitude of different solutions that we think will work to make our neighborhood more safe. So um, I want to be clear that 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 none of the monies that are associated with the with the funding of these cameras as david mentioned comes from any budget allocation um, we get development monies through the IAG Article 80 process, and we get, as a community, to be able to designate how those funds will be used. There was overwhelming support in the, in the entire South End community, and I'm talking about black and brown and white communities across the South End who support the need for anti-violence prevention. So, Let's be clear about what 831 is and is not. It is, in fact, part of an overall sense of, of a package of solutions for the South End to specifically address gun violence, something that we're all way too familiar with in this city. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Stephen, um, and, and thank you to, to folks for staying on, including the administration. I know technically we thought we had a hard stop at um, 11.30, and um, I see, is it, let's see, Romolda, is that right? Michelle, we can go to her. I think she was the one that was on, but then we skipped. Yeah, I live on have a minute left. <laughs> um, I have a minute left if you're on, and then I will follow up. I know there were others as well who were hoping to testify. I will follow up. Romald, are you on? Yes, Hi. I am. Hi, hello. Sorry, I have a minute or so left, but I will follow up with you too as well, but you can say a few words. Uh, um, for some reason, I think we lost you earlier when we tried to yeah. get to you. And then, um, and then I'll wrap up really quickly. Go ahead. Well, um, for a minute, um, I mean, I'm speaking as someone who was on a brick report in the past, someone whose um, life's been ruined due to being on a brick report, right? I will take full responsibility in any actions that I've committed or any harm that I've committed in my community. And that's why I am the person I am today. And that's why I make a lot of change in my community. I also went back and I'm working with that same population that you know I left behind in making change. We keep talking about, I am a resident for 38 years of voting in Geneva. We keep talking about my parents' own homes 
let's be clear on that. And, you know, we pay taxes and all of that. So our voices need to be heard. My parents' voices need to be heard. Why aren't our people invited to spaces like this so they can speak on their own community, the community that they live in, that they pay taxes in, that they raise their family from? Why aren't these people in these spaces? Why aren't people like me invited to these spaces so we could talk about how this is not effective for our community or our people? We're just going to be surveillance. That's what it is. There's going to be more of our bodies are going to be locked up. So what have we solved? Nothing. We, there's a lot more that we can do with that money, and that minute is gone, so I can't tell you that. But maybe we need to contact the people of my community, like myself and many others who are out here who are working, whether we were street workers in the past and violence interrupters and now have our own program. Because, again, there's money being allocated to programs that are geared to work with this population, but they don't. Because if they did, we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. Boston has tons of opportunities, resources, programs to help these people. As someone who used to work in these programs, I'm going to be honest with you, it's a free check and people are not doing their job. So before we talk about adding more police cameras and, I mean, surveillance and, and surveillance in our people, let's talk about actually building our people and working with our people. Not, act, not saying we're doing something that we're clearly not doing. If you guys want to take a walk with me on voting in Geneva, let's do that. And let's talk to these young men and women and what it is, is that they need to strive and do better. Because surveillance is not going to do anything. Our people are still going to be poor. We're still going to have communication issues. We're still going to be in the struggle. No matter what you put up, no matter how many officers you add to the table, no matter what you do, unless we help our people, this stuff is going to continue to happen. And I'm just asking that you guys reach out to me and let's work together as someone who has caused harm, who is now working to, so no one else can further cause harm. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and I'm glad you got back on. And I apologize if we missed you earlier. I think you were disconnected. Yes. I appreciate your honesty. And frankly, I think it's, it's a good way for this hearing, frankly, to end on your note. My team and I will absolutely follow up. I have a part of uh, Bowdoin and Geneva in my district. I split it with Councilor Baker. We will follow up. But really appreciate you being candid um, and speaking to the root causes of violence, which we covered more in that June hearing, less so this hearing because of time. So I appreciate that, but we'll follow up for sure. Um, and I just thank you. Thank you so much. And Michelle, thank you. Thank you. And, and Michelle, thank you. Um, and Carrie for navigating the, the technology piece. We had a lot of folks on, which isn't as um, which isn't usual when we have panelists and discussions because we we're covering a lot of grants. So obviously this uh, hearing covered four different dockets. We will have some follow up questions that we will send. Um, we have some follow up questions that we will send to the administration with respect to some of the dockets. Um, all four will be reviewed and um, will be voted on, uh, or possibly voted on the next council meeting. Um, which I believe is slated for, let me just make sure I have the date correct. Michelle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it is on the 29th. So next week, Wednesday, July 29th at noon. Um, thank you for all the panelists, all of the advocacy organizations, those who couldn't participate in public testimony who um, emailed us, thank you. You can continue to email us and add your testimony to the record. We will follow up with respect to questions specifically for the BRIC. I will also follow up in terms of creating a space for the BRIC and some of the community organizations to come together and have more robust um, and, and helpful and informative conversations than we can do in this platform. Um, so thank you all. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>